decade, Saturdays and Illegal Curve have been synonymous with one another. With insight, analysis, and interviews regarding the Winnipeg Jets, the Manitoba Moose, and all around the NHL, here are Dave Manouk, Ezra Ginsberg, and your host, Drew Mendel. The Illegal Curve Hockey Show starts now. Well, Mandy got it right. Dave Manouk is here. Drew Mendel, Ezzy Ginsberg, not so much. Those two guys are away from the show. So I am joined by Connor Harabchuk. Good morning, Winnipeg. Good morning, Manitoba. And for all of those joining us live, wherever you're joining us live from on the interweb, good morning to you and welcome to the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Connor Harabchuk of the Hockey Writers of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Where else are you, Connor? <laughs> well, those are the two most notable things. So you, you hit you hit that. But thanks for having me on. First time on the uh, the show, the Saturday AM show. I've been, I've joined you on a few post game shows before, but yeah, it's gonna be fun. Lots to talk about. Let's get to it. Well, look at this, Connor. They 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 see you as and a level Sunday, flight, but they also yeah. recognize that it's Sunday morning. So yes, there you go. That's that. that, that's a good sign. That means you're making some uh, some waves there in the market. We like to hear it. Oh, Connor's yeah. a Connor's what we call an up and comer. I'm not going to say I discovered Connor, but I may have taken him under my wing uh, at Moose Games. Now he's too big for the Moose. He's a he's a Jets guy, so yeah. Yeah. he's, he's got he's getting a little too big for his britches. Uh, he still talks to me because he's not he doesn't have a choice because he sits beside me in the press box. But uh, yeah, Connor's good egg. He knows what he's doing. He's an up and comer. So make Thank sure you, you're paying Dave. attention to Connor. Connor, his uh, his who's Connor Hebchek like without a one? Like you're Connor. You're, you're yeah. Like, who well, who stole your Twitter account? Me. I, I think it was me. I, I messed up making like multiple accounts and then was just like, okay, mm. Connor Rapjack won. And then <laughs> that was the one that stuck. And like Twitter actually didn't think I was a bot and made me or let me use it. So yeah, mm. I'll just forever have that one. I am the one Connor Rapjack. That's just what we'll, <laughs> we'll go with. You're the first the only and only. One. The first yeah. and only. Okay. I can't claim yeah. to be the only Dave Manuk. There's multiples of us, unfortunately. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But. Yeah um let's get into some jets talk we've got two hours of jets talk coming your way here on the illegal curve hockey show the jets are taking on the senators tonight which means of course an illegal curve post game show my tardy co-host will be uh will be back at least one of them as he as he's not only is he going to be back he's coming to the game so i mean it's going to be uh it's going to be a big big night connor be ready you're gonna have an ezra ginsburg experience in the press box which is always another level of of taking things but for now it's just you and i we're going to talk about the jets and and yesterday there's a lot there's lots to talk about I was at mm -hmm. the uh, Hockey for All Center yesterday. It was packed because they had a huge tournament. So I had to pa park far, far back. But I was there early and I got a chance to see Gabriel Velarde on the ice. And he's been on the ice since uh, the Jets returned to Winnipeg. Uh, well, they returned, I think, on Sunday or Monday. But they got on the ice for the first time morning skate on Tuesday when they were getting ready to take on the Oilers. We saw Gabriel Velarde. We saw him in a regular jersey. So that was a pretty good indication that he was feeling sufficiently fine to not even be in a non-contact with his first skate with that group and then of course the team was off i believe on wednesday and they skated again on thursday he wasn't a player and rick bonus said well we'll see how he is at tomorrow's practice tomorrow being friday of course and um then we'll go from there so he wasn't going to give up too much but like i said when line rushes began on thursday on friday morning or friday afternoon i guess because it was at noon when they began gabriel velarde was on the line with connor and Shifley. And so you're like, mm -hmm. okay, well, that's a pretty good indication that Gabriel Velarde is back and he's ready to return. And not only do this Jets team desperately need him, they also, mm -hmm. the power play desperately needs him. And we, Goodness. and yeah. and again, I know you weren't there yesterday, but the benefit, we saw it immediately because when they were, when PP1 was practicing and Tyler Toffoli went, moved to PP2 and you had Gabriel Velarde, they were whipping it around and they were scoring goals. And I know it's just <laughs> practice, but it was a good sign for the power play and it's a good sign for the jets that gabriel velarde is back after i mean remember folks his last game was february 29th and interestingly connor and i'll fill in the folks in case they didn't read it on illegalcurve.com or watch right. it on our youtube channel the interview with gabriel velarde but one of the things that he said was he was feeling he was feeling that he wasn't 100 percent in that second intermission of the game against dallas on february 29th he went to rick bonus and he said rick i just i don't have it I don't have it to give to the team. Not that he didn't want to, but he could tell his body was not where it needed to be in terms of his ability to play the game. Mm -hmm. And and Rick Bonus had said to him, "Well, come up and be on the bench with with the team and and you know try and uh, uplift their spirits or whatever it was." But I just thought it was interesting because we don't generally see that, right? Connor, like most right. times when a guy's an injured, 
he just he he done for the night and that's it. But clearly yeah. there's something there. So I mean, I just from your takeaway, right? February 29th, March 30th. So it's over a month since mm -hmm. we've last seen Gabriel Velarde in the Jets lineup. He will return to the lineup. That was confirmed by him, and that was confirmed by the coach. So what's your biggest takeaway of the Jets getting back? Uh, uh, clearly a very critical top line winger. Yeah, I, I do want to say I, I did watch the Gabriel Velarde um, interview on the Illegal Curve YouTube. And go. I want to say the exchange of him saying that he was in the lineup was pretty funny. Because mm -hmm. he's like, oh, what Rick said, but I'm playing. Yeah. <laughs> Rick was like, oh, he said he's playing? Yeah. Um, but no, he's, he's back. He's much needed. And I feel like over that time, since February 29th till now, they've been molding that lineup. Like Connor and Shafley have been with Aya Follow. They've been with Nemesnikov. Um, on that top line, kind of just waiting for Gabriel Velarde to take his spot back on that top line. Um, and then the rest of the lines are the rest of the lines. But it just feels like they've been waiting for him to come back and take that spot on the top line because they like what they see on that line, um, or what they've seen in the past. And you, you bring up, and Gabriel Velarde said, well, it's always nice to score, even if it's in practice. I think even the sign of them snapping it around and scoring in practice is good because mm – -hmm alternative they they struggle and they don't get any shots on goal in practice <laughs> more concerned like people will say oh it's just practice but like yeah it's pra practice how you play it's like a very old cliche but hey if you're gonna score goals in practice you're probably gonna score goals in the game and uh i had someone it was funny i i tweeted out gabriel Vlardi's j fresh hockey card yesterday and i had someone in the mention saying that he's a power play specialist and it, it made me think like if Gabriel Vlardy comes back and it's it's like he's like a neutral fit on that top line for Connor and Shifley, five on five, mm -hmm. and he's a power play specialist, and the power play gets going, mm -hmm. would the Jets like be thrilled with that? Like, I don't know. I thought they played a pretty good five on five game against Vegas, and the, they, they went over five on the power play. So if Vlardy came back and they played ex the exact same way, but went two for five, they win that game. Like, I, I if they, if if they if you told me right now that over the last nine games of the regular season, Gabriel Vlardy is just going to be a power play specialist, I think the Jets would take that. I think they would. <laughs> well, and it's so. and it's interesting because Rick Bonus talked about that and and mm -hmm. and in his availability and and it's funny because Kelly Moore qualified. He said, "Rick, I just want you to know we do already have some information." <laughs> so Rick yeah. kind of was yeah. amused about that. And we don't know if Laurent Brassois will be the starter. The presumption is he will be the starter. Mm -hmm. um, the morning skate gets underway. It's probably going to be an optional because it was heavily attended. The only guy missing yesterday was Josh Morrissey. I asked Rick Bonus about that uh, in our availability. And I said, you know, he played 30 minutes. So I presume it's it's just that. And he said, yeah, it's just a maintenance day for him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was his 29th birthday and they played him over 29 minutes. So uh, yeah. he got a well-deserved day off the next day. But, mm -hmm. um, and he was phenomenal in that hockey game. I mean, he, he was, was, he yeah. was absolutely, uh, stellar to say the least, but yeah, like, I mean, to me, one of the things that Rick Bonus talked about was the idea of how Gabriel Velarde's usage. So yes, he'll be up on that top line with Mark Shifley and Cal Connor, but the impression I was given, and it's funny because coaches often say something and then it mm -hmm. gets completely thrown out the window because if I recall correctly, Gabriel, I don't want to say that I'm having deja vu, but now I am because I'm pretty sure when Gabriel Velarde came back after his um, his injury that he suffered in game three of the season, yeah. Rick Bonus said he was going to ease him back into the lineup. Did he not? Yes. And so, he did, he did. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and yesterday, he said the exact same thing. He said, well, you know, he might not be playing those same minutes. And so we'll see. We'll see if they just heavily use him on the power play where there's an advantage where you can kind of do that. Because, you know, by Gabriel Velarde's own admission, he didn't skate for, he didn't do anything for about two weeks. He said, he just kind of like was, you know, dealing with the process. And, and he said like the spleen is back to normal, but he doesn't know how he got it. It wasn't mono. He was asked that. Yeah. He just said like, he, they don't, he said he may never know what was the cause of that issue, but ultimately he didn't. And he said, but he said he's been on for like at least the last week, really working well and really getting, you know, mm -hmm. kind of into the groove. But ultimately, you know, it's just, you know, I saw the comment about the Allen Iverson practice, practice. We're talking yeah. about practice. So yes, obviously in Gabriel Velarde too, was similarly skeptical as you saw in yeah. his chat about, you know, well, it's just practice and you can't replicate a game. And look, mm -hmm. the senators are hot right now. Four straight wins. Uh, they beat the Oilers. They beat the devils. They also beat uh, the Hawks and the Sabres. But the fact is that, you know, they've, they've been playing better of late. We'll talk to Alex Adams at 10 30 about that. He covers the uh, senators for the hockey news. So um, we'll get into the sentence a little bit later, but 
like I said, Connor, this is this to me is again, I don't want to, we're not going to belabor the point too, too much, but what has been missing from this team? And it's weird because the biggest strength of this team when when Nick when Kyle Connor was gone was the mm-hmm. depth and the depth stepping up and the depth right. scoring. But we know that scoring becomes more difficult as the season goes along. And you've got nine mm-hmm. games left, but getting Gabriel Velarde, I think, is going to be a huge boost for this team, both on and off the ice. I think so too. I agree. And just to quickly touch on the easing him back in comment that you brought up there. It yeah. also happened for Kyle Connor, who Rick Bonus said the same thing that he said with Velarde today, basically saying, yeah, he's on the top line, but I don't know if he's going to play the whole game on the top line. He might take mm-hmm. some shifts off. And then I'm pretty sure Kyle Connor that night played like 18, like his regular 18, 20 minutes. So maybe it was so, Connor and not Velarde that I was thinking of, but it's well, the premise still is, is yes, the same. Yes, yes. But he said the same thing about Velarde. He'll be on okay, the top yeah. line, but he won't take every shift. Yeah. We'll see because he very well might. Um, but I do think, and and I think another big issue with this team over this five-game losing streak, since the Rangers game, which the, the top line was great, Connor and Shifley, Shifley had the hat trick. But yeah. I think over that five-game losing streak, the top line has been getting outscored and the other lines aren't making up for it. Yeah. Um, and maybe like in a, in a sample size, um, Velarde, Shifley, and Connor got shelled analytically, and their goal differential was kind of even. Mm-hmm. If Velarde can come back and maybe give that line something that they haven't had over the last five games, I feel like that's a big boost. I don't know if it's going to happen. I wouldn't bet on it happening, but the power play we talked about it. That's the biggest thing. If he resurrects the power play and gives it some life down low, that's all. That's all the Jets are really asking for, I think, over the rest of this homestand as he gets back up to speed. And then hopefully that Connor Shifley Velarde trio can do something and contribute and not get outscored and shelled defensively at five on five. But for the time being, if he's just a power play specialist and the power play wakes up and gets going and they get a win and they start going on a streak a little bit here and gaining more chemistry, I think it could have a ripple effect. But I, I'm not expecting the top line of Connor Shifley Velarde to go out and outchance their opponents like 10 nothing tonight because mm-hmm. Velarde's rusty um and in the first place they weren't doing that when they were together during the season right yeah. um but at the same time i i think that the top line is a higher chance of outchancing their opponents with Velarde up there than an Aya follow or an Amesnikov that's kind of what gives me hope for the top line to kind of uh change course here mm-hmm. from these last 5 games um, but for, for the rest of the homestand, let's say, I'm really just looking at the power play for Gabe Velarde because he'll be rusty. He'll be getting up, back up to speed. But the power play, he can just stand there side of the net. He doesn't need to, to move too much. <laughs> well, you know, and and we look, we've, we've spent the first 15 minutes of the show talking about Gabriel Velarde. And, and yeah, it, it's not a bad thing. I mean, there's a reason no. why he's like he was a big piece. He was the biggest piece of that Pierre-Luc Dubois trade. So there's sure. a reason why that, you know, folks Top are line player. <laughs> yeah, and and, it, and it's unfortunate. Look, he called it. Uh, what did he? What was his line yesterday? I thought it was the so Gabe funny. Velarde fortune. The Gabe Velarde. The, I, yeah, I have to say, like, and I wrote about it in today's morning papers on a little site called TheLegalCurve.com. But I just think that there's no the the level of like self deprecating honesty that this guy brings. Yeah. He he's just he's a different sort of player. He's a different sort of person. I like it. Like, I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's it's not what you expect from a hockey player, but I mean, I'm, I'm all there for it because it's, it's, yeah. it's a refreshing, honest self-reflection when he speaks about himself. He's not, he's not BSing you. He's not blowing smoke. It's not, he's not dropping cliches like we are. So, I mean, he's yeah. doing a good, he, he, again, he's a, he's a good, he's a, he's a worthwhile interview. Let's put it that way. So, yeah, but, but moving away from Velarde in that top line, because we agree that the top line has to play better. They have to play defensively 100%. better. And it's not just the top line. I mean, that to me is kind of the overarching theme is that return mm-hmm. to what was successful, right? Like it's such an interesting concept in, it doesn't matter what it is, right? Like it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, sales or hockey, you know, like you're, if you're successful in one capacity and then you try and change things mm-hmm. and you're not successful, it, it does it not stand to reason again, going, thinking logically that if you return to that, which was successful for you, i.e. a tighter defensive format, you're going to have more success. And we saw it mm-hmm. with the jets, not allowing, you know, what was it? Th- more than three goals for 34 straight games. And yeah. like, I guess what I'm asking Connor in a roundabout way is, do you think in these final nine games, we saw it better in that Vegas game. We saw it in mm-hmm. the Rangers game. Do you think 
And even in the Oilers game at points, like the second period mm-hmm. was a, was it was a disaster. But yeah. but do you think that we're seeing a slow sort of reversion to that sort of defensive structure that brought this team success? And also the other thing I would point out quickly, and just that it's more of a thought than than really with respect to that question. But it is interesting that this is going to be the first game that the entire lineup is back together. Like I don't expect right. Cole to be in the lineup, but it will be the first game where you have all the new additions and Velarde and Shifley and Connor. So this is like not this is not a frequent occurrence no. that we get to yeah. see everybody together. Yeah, but the defensive structure. I mean, I'm not expecting them to go the last nine games allowing three goals or less. Like I don't think they're going to pick right up where where they left off over a month ago now, two months ago mm-hmm. maybe. Um, mm-hmm. But I do think, and you you mentioned that Vegas game, I do think that that was like a, a tangible result where you can point to that and say, okay, we actually played pretty well defensively. Yeah. Obviously, they don't come away with the win. I pin it completely on the power play for why yeah. they didn't come away with the win. Um, not their defensive structure and not like Connor Hellbuck. I thought the the defensive side of their of their team and even their forwards kind of back checking making sure that there was support coming back when the defenseman wouldn't pit would pinch because Morrissey played 30 minutes he was pinching a lot yeah. um I think they they I think they did that well and I do think that that was a step in the right direction even the Oilers game like you said in the first and third period I would say that that was a step in the right direction the penalty kill maybe doesn't fall under that category I still think that there's work to be done there so we can just mm-hmm. Group special teams under the same umbrella and just yeah, yeah, of course, push, it in, the, push sure. it in the corner. Um, <laughs> but five on five defensively, uh, I do think that that Vegas game was a step in the right direction. Can you follow it up? I, like tonight against Ottawa is is a game you have to win. You've lost five straight. Um, but can you follow it up Monday against LA, another playoff opponent? And they have this four game road trip coming up against four Central Division opponents: Nashville, Dallas, Colorado, Minnesota. Uh, can you do it then? And then they play Vancouver to end the year. Like there's games here where they're going to be able to prove themselves and prove that their defensive structure can go back to what it was. Um, like I said, I'm not expecting them to go the last nine games here, allowing three goals or less, but mm-hmm. I do think that their defensive structure will improve from what we've seen over this last two month stretch, ever since the streak was broken where they've been basically a 500 hockey club. And it's for the reason you mentioned, like this is a fully healthy lineup. It's the first time it's been fully healthy in a long time. And I think, once they start gelling, maybe tonight's game against Ottawa is a great start to have everyone back in. Um, and then that road trip is going to really be, in my opinion, like the biggest road trip, like seeing where this team is at going into the playoffs. That's going to be the road trip. You go into Dallas, you go into Colorado, show us what you've got. Um, and I think if they can shut those teams down defensively, not completely, because you can't hold Nathan McKinnon down for too long. But if you yeah. can win that game, you know, allow only two goals, prove that you're a defensive juggernaut heading into the playoffs, then that's, that's all that really matters. But to answer your question, I'm not not really expecting them to go the last nine games here, completely shutting everyone down. But I do think that they'll be better than what they've been over the last two months. Yeah. And and look, every single player has said, and the coaching staff as well has said, yeah, well, not only do they know that that's what the winning formula is, but they've all acknowledged that it's not an easy way to play hockey it's just yes. not and so it but it's winning and would you rather win games that sometimes aren't the most fun to play or would you rather lose games but you have more fun well i think we know the answer and we know what well, it's going to take yeah. to yeah i'll great. ask that in the post game to rick bonus or, or to the players and you can i like will be idiot. on the show but i'll be <laughs> eagerly waiting your uh yeah, your questions yeah. tonight and and speaking of rick bonus it's the you know i just saw in the the group chat here so we're advised that it's just scratches taking the optional morning skate this morning. Yeah. So uh, I guess that would give us an indication as to what the lineup is going to look like. The pregame report on a little site called allelecurve.com. Connor knows it. He reads it every single day. I've been reliably <laughs> informed by his ISP that I keep monitored. But the <laughs> expectation, just to be clear, is that uh, you're, like I said, just to be clear and let everybody know, the first line, as we talked about, will be uh, Connor Sheffield Velarde. The Foley, Monaghan, Ehlers is your second line. Third line, no surprise, Niederreiter, Lowry, Appleton. And your fourth line, Baron, Nemestnikov, and Ayafalo. Good to see, I guess I should have mentioned that, uh, Vlad Nemestnikov after taking that hit from Nick Haig, a hit that Mark Shifley was still somewhat confused about the next day as to yeah. you know why he got the instigator, why he, since they dropped, both dropped the gloves at the same time. Why? And one thing we were talking about before we did our media was the fact that, like, why did he get a fighting major? That was really not a fight. Yeah. By any stretch, it was more grappling than anything. 
I like I, I the, personally, I thought the five minute, and again, we don't need to focus too much on that, but I just mm. I, I can understand it because it it looks like it's a five minute major, deserves to be. I, I really thought if they were going to be smart, they would have done a five in a you know, five minutes for for Haig, two minutes for Shifley. So you have three minutes of a major there for the yeah. Jets That's versus yeah. the way they kind of did it, because really all you ended up doing is you kick Shifley out of the game, essentially. <laughs> You lose Vlad Nemestikov because he has to go to the room. So the Jets actually end up losing, and and Vegas loses Nick Hague. So it it really did kind of change the momentum. And and Mark Shifley was, you know, he he treaded lightly, Connor. He didn't want to get yeah. too deep into that. He didn't want to get into tr- too much trouble. But you know, like I said, it it is a good sign that you've got this full contingent. And and again, the expectation on defense. So we'll we'll get into the Cole Perfetti. I think we'll probably talk about Cole Perfetti. At the 10 o'clock hour, we're having Mike McIntyre sure. going to pick free press on in about uh, eight minutes time here on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. So we won't necessarily talk about Cole Perfetti's uh, um, sitting just yet. The expectation is that it will be Laurent Brassois. Again, we'll know that around 930 when Rick Bonus is speaking to the media from the Matt Frost Media Center. But uh, mm-hmm. the expectation is it'll be Morrissey DeMello, Dylan and Pionk, and I think Stanley and Schmidt. So maybe we can talk about Logan Stanley a little bit. He, the mm-hmm. Stanimal. He's been uh, he's been catching people's eyes for the right reasons for the most part. There was that little gaffe in the first goal where he kind of took away. Speaking of eyes, Connor Hellebuck's eyes, not the best yeah. situation for a defenseman to block your goaltender. But from your viewing of the Stanimal, what has been your mm-hmm. sort of thought process on what he's brought to this team in terms of look two big fights and his pumping up the crowd and all yeah, that as he heads yeah. to the penalty box? And you're there, you're sitting right beside me, you're watching this, so you can see what it does in the building. But what have been your impressions Absolutely. of Logan Stanley in the last the last little bit? I think that stuff is great. Like, and and people forget, but both of these fights, like, it's not like he's being told told to go out there and just fight to get the crowd pumped up. Like, both of the fights came as a result of him hitting someone, and then the mm-hmm. other team being like, "No, we don't like that. Um, we're gonna fight," which gets into a whole nother discussion. Why didn't the Jets then get the instigator uh, power play? <laughs> but yeah. I digress. That's a whole nother conversation. Sure, but. Hey, both of these games, he he lays a big hit in the corner and the other team doesn't like it and he's asked to fight. I'd say he won both fights. And yeah, like you said, he's pumping the crowd up. The one against Vegas, he's looking at the bench going like, let's go. Like he's he's firing the team up, firing the crowd up. And you've got to love that. As for his play in terms of like, um, he didn't play very much against Vegas mm-hmm. um, it, like in, in general, but I do think that he's skating pretty well. Um, he's, he's still analytically not doing the greatest. So I'd be, I'd be reluctant to call him like the number six defenseman going forward. And like game one of the playoffs, he's in the lineup. I I'd pump the brakes on that, but he's definitely done a job. He's filled in, um, the fights, the hits. Those are, those are real things that you can point to and say he's done well. And he's, he's doing what the coaching staff is asking of him. The other side, like that is one part of this conversation. The other side of this mm-hmm. is why is Dylan Sandberg not in the lineup? I, I, my, the whole season, Dylan Sandberg, in my opinion, has been fantastic. He's been the, the sixth defenseman, the, the number five on that third pairing with Nate Schmidt for most of the year. Um, and I thought he'd been great. And now he's sitting, uh, the Edmonton game was really puzzling because Edmonton, isn't like this big physical team. Mm -hmm. Um, They're more of a speedy team and Dylan Sandberg excels at like defending plays off the rush. Like that's his MO as a defender. Uh, So him not being in the lineup for that game was really concerning. And then Vegas, Rick bonus talked about it with Perfetti, but sure. You want these big physical players. You want Stanley in there. Sure. But I still in Sandberg six, four, like he's, it's not like he's, he's the small defenseman that's going to get absolutely pummeled by Vegas's forwards. Um, and I just don't see where it really went wrong. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> um, I don't really see where it went sideways for Dylan Sandberg in the coaching staff's eyes. And also there's another, a whole nother side of this conversation where Colin Miller hasn't played a game in over a week now since that New Jersey game. But you know what? Um, I just, just to quickly jump in on that one, Connor, mm-hmm. I, I don't mind that because Colin Miller wasn't brought sure. in, in my mind, Colin Miller was a dev. Right. He was literally totally. just like the kind of the, the Jordy Ben, if you will, a little bit better than Jordy Ben uh, when he was brought in. But I just right. think he, to me, he he wasn't there necessarily to replace. I know he got some opportunities. Yes. He had some PP2 time. But 
I just think he was, he's a depth addition. So you don't have to go to the farm so you can make, so you have a guy who's, you know, made it all the way to the Stanley cup finals. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, like I, I don't mean to interject too, too significantly on your point. I just wanted to say like, totally. I, I do understand why like Schmidt and, and, you know, I just uh, highlighted the comment from partisan Paul. I hope he's a partisan on this side of the equation, but he said that Sandberg and Schmidt have been a good pairing and analytically they have, they have been. So, I mean, you, you do wonder what the team will go with and, and look, Rick bonus, old, old school coach. So it's not a surprise. He likes the physicality, likes the, the size that Logan Stanley brings. But I guess like, I guess for a guy who's been pilloried as much as Logan Stanley, it's probably yeah. got to be some validation to know that, you know, like his play again, we're not, he's not Josh Morrissey, right? Like Josh Morrissey played 29 minutes. Logan Stanley played what? 10 minutes last game. I don't think yeah. it was in 10. I think it was sub 10, but point is that, you know, for a guy who's received as many slings and arrows as he has, he's, yes. he's at least offset it a little bit with his play of late. And yeah, that, that, that was the first part of my point. Like I, I do think he's playing well and he's done a job he's filled in, but it's like against Edmonton and against Vegas, I feel like those are measuring stick games, whatever you want to call it, where you're playing yeah. against playoff opponents in your, in your own barn and Logan Stanley plays both games over Dylan Sandberg. Like where does that leave us in terms of round one game? One of the playoffs is Logan Stanley, mm-hmm. Now in, do they trust him more than Dylan Sandberg? I don't think that would be the right decision because like I said, Dylan Sandberg has been fantastic this season and the pairing with Nate Schmidt analytically real goals, whatever you want to look at. um, They they've been great as well. So I, I don't like the decision to scratch Dylan Sandberg over the last two games. Obviously we don't have official confirmation for tonight's game. So I won't say that part of it, but for the last two games, I didn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll see what happens tonight, but I, I'm just I'm concerned about where this leaves um, the the pecking order on the on the back end in terms of is Stanley in the lineup over Sandberg in these playoff type games in round one game one of the playoffs. It's something to watch for going forward for sure. And perhaps opponent plays a role in that as well. We'll find out uh, more in a few weeks' time. But for now, we're gonna head to break, and when we come back, Mike McIntyre of the Winnipeg Free Press will join us here on the Legal Curve Hockey Show. This is. Connor Hepchuk, I'm Dave Manouk, and we will be right back after these words from our sponsors. Keeping Winnipeg laughing for over 30 years. Rumors, Canada's longest running comedy club, bringing you the biggest laughs from the best comedians on the planet. Jerry Seinfeld, Chris Rock, Jon Stewart, Dennis Miller, Brad Garrett, the greats, and all the up-and-comers too. When was the last time you laughed out loud? Make it a great night out with friends or book your office or birthday party. Even a fundraising event at Rumors. Get all the details and dates on upcoming shows at RumorsComedyClub.com. Whoa, Ezzy, everything okay? You look stressed. Of course I'm stressed. We're moving, the house is upside down, the kids failed miserably at packing the fine china, and my life is in chaos. Chaos! Yes, that does sound like a problem. What am I going to do? Ezzy, relax. Rolly's transfer moving and storage is the answer. With 60 years of experience in moving Manitobans and a track record of exemplary customer service, one call to Rolly's and your stress is gone. No job is too big or too small. Just visit rollies.com and they will take it from there. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Rollies Transfer Moving and Storage, online at rollies.com. Hey, Drew. Ezzy, whoa, what a smile. Yeah, I got my crowns done at Linden Market Dental Center and they whiten my teeth. I see. They're so bright that every time I smile, they go, We have hockey tonight. Do you have a mouth guard to protect those pearly whites? I sure do. Whoa, they even ting through the mouth guard. Linden Market Dental Center covers all your dental needs from restorative to cosmetic dentistry and will fit you with a sports guard for that active lifestyle. 877 Waverly. See LindenMarketDental.com. Boston Pizza harnessed Fanalytics to test if the game is better at home or at Boston Pizza. The results are irrefutable. Catch the game at Boston Pizza. Powered by Fanalytics. We did it again. You're on fire, man. There's power in a handshake. After a great game or great deal, it shows professionalism and respect. Two quality Zapia Group Realty take pride in. You don't build a business where 95% of your clients are referred by others without honesty, integrity, and total dedication to client satisfaction. To sell your home for more in less time, shake hands with Frank and Mauro Zappia of Zappia Group Realty. Get started at zappiagroup.com.
Welcome back to a special edition of the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Only special because we're joined by Connor Harabchuk of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Although Gary Lawless had some beef with you in your Winnipeg Sports Talk hoodie. We'll talk about that another time because we yeah. want to welcome to the show. We don't want to keep him waiting. I mean, he's just a VIP guest right now. Mike McIntyre of the Winnipeg Free Press. He is at home ready to do this show. Hey, Mike, how are you? I'm doing well, fellas. Good morning to you. Well, it's good to have you. I mean, we were sitting together in the Matt Frost Media Center, this trio, a yes. couple of days ago when uh, I got the call from Ez that, you know, he was going <laughs> to be unavailable. So I asked Connor and I said, well, we could just pre-tape because we're all here. We may as well get it going. But we didn't pre-tape because we knew that there could be some news, Mike. And there was some pretty big news on Friday. There was, yeah. We were kind of anticipating that um, Gabe Velarde could be ready to go. Uh, obviously, a lot was going to hinge on how yesterday's practice went. And uh, by all accounts, uh, he got through that just fine. And uh, what he's missed basically the entire month of March, right? It was mm -hmm. February 29th, uh, the third period against Dallas, when he uh, exited that game. And the Jets, we know, just had... a. Uh, an extremely busy month of March with 16 games. He's missed the first 15, and now he will be back tonight. Um, correct me if my math is wrong. I believe the Jets are 7-7-1 seven, seven, and one now through the month of March. Not, not great, not mm -hmm. terrible. Uh, I think, you know, you could say treading water, right? 500 hockey. Um, but considering, you know, what the month brought and the fact they didn't have Gabe Velarde, who was um, certainly going pretty well before he went down with that injury. The power play was clicking. He seemed to really have found a home, you know, in that net front spot. Um, to go 7-7-1, seven, seven and one, they've had a lot of travel. A, a, a majority of those 15 games have been on the road. There were a couple, uh, there was a trip out west, a couple trips out east. So, you know, I guess t tonight breaks the tie, right? Either they go, what, 8-7-1 and one, or 7-8-1 and one, or maybe 7-7-2. Seven, seven, and two. Maybe the I was going to only that out. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's a there's a kind of sky is falling uh, mentality. Because, look, the Jets haven't won in five games. And mm -hmm. um, it's a results-oriented business. And the results haven't been there lately. But I think there's a lot of reason for optimism around the Jets. Obviously, Gabe Velarde coming back is, is a big one. And, you know, they've got nine games now to get him back uh, up to speed. And I think it's important that he gets this, this much runway, as opposed to, say, returning with you know, two or three games left in the season. Um, it's not so much what Gabe Velarde can do over these next couple of weeks. It's it's what he and this entire lineup can do uh, when the playoffs begin, which, by the way, is three weeks from today. I saw they, they moved the date up. They were going to be starting, I think, on the 22nd. Now they're saying they're starting on Saturday the 20th. So uh, we don't have to wait too much longer for the stage to get even bigger. And you know, you could make an argument, guys, that the lineup the Jets will roll out tonight, mm -hmm. not only is it the deepest of this season, um, because they've never had, you know, Tyler Toffoli has never been in the lineup at the same time as Gabe Velarde. Like, they, mm -hmm. they don't, this is the deepest lineup of the year. You could make an argument this is the deepest lineup they've really ever rolled out uh, in 2.0. And you, you brought up Gabriel Velarde and the power play. And I don't know if it's officially like over their last 21 or 22. It's somewhere in the, the 20s there. But I think that's what everyone's really looking for is his ability to play at the side of the net there and have an impact on the power play. What are you looking for in this game tonight against Ottawa as, as a starter um, for Gabe Velarde's impact on the power play? And do you think he can kind of bring it back from the dead and, and give it some life here? <laughs> a good way to put it because yeah it has been uh, it's been comatose at the very least these last uh few games you know they they're they're getting their chances they've had five power plays in the first two games on this homestand games guys that were very winnable that were up for grabs and they've gone over 10 and you know they're they got the point obviously against the oilers they lost the the tough one against vegas um you could make an argument that if even if they get one power play goal in each of the last two games they're, they're two and oh probably they're on a two-game win mm -hmm. streak uh as opposed to a five-game winless streak 
when Gabe Velarde was was in the lineup and just before he went out, I mean, the power play to me, it, it's almost as if it was redesigned to now run through him. He was really controlling things down low there. And, you know, teams had to make a decision. He was He was operating so efficiently in that net front spot that if teams backed off and gave him any kind of room, he was making them pay. We saw what he could do, you know, in tight, great set of hands. He'd take that puck right to the net. And if he didn't score, he was causing chaos that was quickly leading to a goal or at the very least some great chances. As we saw teams maybe now start to focus on him saying, hey, we got to pay attention to this guy. He was now opening up everyone else on the ice. Let's have an extra player out there so they can't cover everyone. And that was making the likes of Shifley and Connor and Monaghan and Morrissey more dangerous. So we just haven't seen that really, at least consistently, since he's been out. They've obviously tried different combinations. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that that's a huge key, right? Because as we go, look to, to the playoffs, we know special teams um, can be a really significant factor in in wins and losses and you know we we haven't heard rick bonus very often this year guys after games say our special teams won us the game Mm -hmm. but i've lost track of how many times he's come out and said special teams cost us the game um you, you know that that's been a story for sure for a long time with the jets and uh certainly having dave velarde back um, you know, now Tyler Toffoli will go to that second unit. Um, you know, we'll see what that potentially can look like. Uh, I just think it, it makes the Jets a lot more dangerous. Um, wa- watched, you know, they've got five power plays the last two games. They'll probably get none tonight now. <laughs> yeah. That's sometimes the way hockey works. But, uh, yeah, it'll be really interesting to watch. And, you know, the other storyline, of course, is I think what this just does to the whole lineup. No offense to Alex Iafalo. Um, he's probably a little miscast at five mm-hmm. on five on the, on a top line. Yeah. Um, and so now like this, you know, you look at the fourth line, what they're going to roll out tonight with Ayafalo and Nemestikov and Baron, like Ayafalo and Nemestikov have both had stints, significant stints playing basically on the top line. Now they're fourth liners. Um, and then you've got guys like Cole Perfetti and David Gustafson who can't even get in the lineup. Like, Speaking to that depth, the Jets have more of it than ever, certainly this year. And uh, they've got nine games to kind of figure it out. And, you know, the, not that they would take anyone lightly at this stage, given what they've done lately. But certainly tonight would seem to be a favorable matchup for the Jets. Yes, I know Ottawa's played quite a bit better lately. Um, but you look at Winnipeg's competition the last two games, it's a bit of a step down. Um this would be a good night for the Jets to maybe get some of that confidence back. Well, Mike, I was going to ask you about the defense, and I plan on doing it. So this is going to be a two-parter because yeah. the chat wants to know, what happened to your hat in New York? Did you uh, lose something oh, in New York? Yes. Well, I did, I did lose. Uh, I lost my hat last year when I went to New York at uh, uh, USB Arena. And it was my favorite hat, too. And I left it behind in the rink. And, uh, and then when I went back there last weekend, I checked the lost and found it is in fact lost, not found. Uh, so I've since replaced the hat with a similar uh, facsimile of, of a hat. But yeah, for those who know me, uh, I tend to lose something on just about every road trip. <laughs> I've lost probably eight or nine sets of headphones. Uh, earlier this year, I lost probably my favorite dress shirt. I left it behind in a closet uh i think i was in pittsburgh for that one i've left a suit jacket that i never found that was at the uh, lax airport Uh, i lost an ipad years ago i've left my phone in uh in a couple ubers um i dropped it outside of a hotel once but i I managed to get that back every time yeah the list is extremely extremely long of things that i've lost I've, i've lost like three pairs of mitts this year already on road trips but I lose those here in Winnipeg as well. So yeah, nothing new. Uh, and honestly, the, the biggest um, factor now is I'm traveling alone, right? It used to be there was a few of us on the road. And mm-hmm. when when my my now teammate, Ken Weeb, when he was like at Sportsnet and he'd be on the road, 
Ken was probably the best. He, he would always remind me, do you have this? Do you have that? Or he'd say, he'd be the one to find something that I'd leave behind. Uh, so I don't have that check and balance with me anymore, which has caused more issues. Well, you have the dump and chase, but you don't have a check and balance. So there's you, there's, there's a little give and take there. <laughs> there so, so, so let's move on to the defense because it seems like, as of lately, that Logan Stanley has supplanted yeah. Dylan Sandberg in this lineup. And, and you know, he's we talk, Connor and I talked about it in the first half an hour of this program. So what's your takeaway from, from this? Is this Rick Bonus kind of showing his old school tendency of getting a, I mean, Dylan Sandberg isn't exactly small, but getting a bigger, heavier guy in the lineup for games against the Oilers and, and, and Golden Knights? Is this him signaling what he made you for the playoffs? I, I know you can't answer those questions specifically because you're not Rick Bonus. But just from your sort of viewing of this, Mike, what are you, how are you seeing this sort of casting of Dylan Sandberg kind of as a as an extra from a, for a guy that we saw as a consistent member of this team and Logan Stanley kind of getting that opportunity now? Yeah, I mean, first off, Logan Stanley, to his credit, he's done everything you probably could have asked of him when he's gotten in the lineup. And, and even going back to earlier this season, like I thought when he'd get in, it's not that he was – showing so poorly that you were like oh they got to get this guy out right away what are they doing like mm -hmm. he has been good in short bursts this year and certainly these last couple games no doubt rick bonus likes the uh the physicality and it's not just the two fights um dave like he he's he has been noticeably more physical in terms of taking the body for a guy his size you know everybody just assumes that oh he'd be this big physical monster out there well he, he doesn't always play that way he really mm -hmm. doesn't um, but we've seen that a little more for sure. And no doubt an old school coach like Rick Bonus has has enjoyed that. So I get keeping him in the lineup. I mean, at this point, it'll be interesting to see, you know, who the Jets first round opponent is, because there certainly is a chance, at least in my eyes, that he's in the starting lineup for the playoffs, depending on the opponent. If the Jets, for example, are playing Dallas, um, yeah. you know, we know Dallas is a very physical team. I could see him potentially playing the Stars. Or if they somehow were to meet Nashville, uh, that would require winning the division at this point. I don't think that's happening anymore. Um, but I suppose they could go on a real heater here in these last nine and maybe the two teams ahead of them struggle a little bit. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a few teams that I can think of. I mean, obviously, if they were to play Vegas, um, you know, another big heavy team, uh, I think, you know, if they're playing Colorado, if they were playing Vancouver, I, I don't know that Logan Stanley is necessarily needed for the same reasons. Um, so I'm not surprised that he's he's performed well and has earned another look. What I am surprised by, though, is that it's coming at the expense of Dylan Sandberg. Um, you know, sure, Nate Smith, Nate Schmidt has been consistent when he's got in. The guy to me that you know, I said this a bit ago too, that I think could use a little bit of a a reset, maybe a game off here or there is Neil Pionk. And, you know, we've seen, we've seen the same, basically two guys, you know, Sandberg and Schmidt rotating with Stanley and Miller. And part of me thought the whole idea here was to try and just maybe get everybody a little bit of a, a breather. And yeah, you know, when the games are still meaningful, you're not going to sit Josh Morrissey or Dylan DeMello or even probably Brendan Dillon. Um, but I thought Neil Pionk's really struggled lately. There, he's had some erratic games, and he's a guy mm -hmm. that maybe would benefit by getting worked into that, that rotation a little bit. Um, but we haven't seen that. And so, you know, now it's Dylan Sandberg who is, is sitting for a bit of an extended period, which uh, to me that's surprising because I think Sandberg – you know, he's been so effective in the role that he's had this year. Um, there's analytics to back that up as well. And uh, I'm sure he's wondering a little bit what he's done to take himself out of the lineup. Um, you know, one thing, though, you can say about this Jets blue line this year, it, it's remarkable how healthy they've been, really. Mm -hmm. like they've had injuries. They've had quite a few injuries, but they've all been to the forwards. Mm -hmm. Not a single defenseman unless I'm forgetting something, nobody's got hurt this year, save for Vili in the preseason. Um, and so, you know, you look at, at the guys on the roster. I was having a chat last night with someone about Kyle Capobianco, who's like, who's saying to me, how come, how come he, he's leading the AHL in defense when scoring? Why isn't he getting a look? And I'm like, well, he probably would have 
had they run into some injuries. They just haven't this mm-hmm. year. And, you know, that's been a storyline for sure, maybe to the detriment of some of these guys who either aren't playing as much as they as they should or aren't playing at all, if in the case of like Capo Bianco and now Vili, who, who can't get up here either. So, yeah, I mean, the Jets have certainly a lot of D if they go on the, the lengthy playoff run that they hope they can. Yeah, they're going to need all these guys because, you know, something tells me that that, you know, they're going to run into injuries or, you know, they're going to want different looks. And uh, so, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see de- during these last nine games um, just how they utilize the blue liners. Like, I don't expect, you know, Dylan Sandberg is going to sit for the rest of the games. I think we'll mm-hmm. continue to see a bit of a rotation um, and, you know, with the idea of trying to keep everyone sharp. Well, and and that's uh, I'll I just was going to jump in and ask you another one because I think the idea of keeping guys fresh isn't a bad thing. That idea no. of keeping these guys, but now that's going to lead into my next question because we just learned something from Rick Bonus's media availability that Connor Hellebuck will be getting the start tonight, so that will be his 500th uh, NHL game. So it's a it's a huge uh, you know uh, milestone for the for the Jets net mine yep. in the 2012 fifth rounder. But are you a little surprised? I mean, Lauren Brassois has been excellent. <laughs> And they're rolling with Connor Hellebuck again. And, you know, the folks at TSN had a whole thing last night about whether uh, with uh, Craig Button talking about whether Connor Hellebuck is being, you know, overworked and whether that's going to be to their detriment. I mean, last year with David Riddich, I understood it. Riddich wasn't reliable as a backup goaltender. Right. So you had to kind of run with Hellebuck right down that kind of last stretch because you want to get into the playoffs. This year, you're not in that same predicament. So are you a little surprised with this news today that it'll be Connor Hellebuck and not Lauren Brassois getting the post? I am, although I must say I, I, I knew the news yesterday because Ken Weeb in the Winnipeg Free Press in today's print edition reported that uh, Connor Hellebuck, he had the inside intel yesterday wow. out of practice. Um, that being said, this is this is the Jets' fifth game in eight days. And Connor Hellebuck has started all of them. Mm-hmm. Now, he he wasn't supposed to start last Sunday. Of course, he got the hook on Saturday. Right. Uh, so he only played half that game. So this will be his, you know, four and a half game in the last eight. But but I never would have predicted if we if we were to go back to a week ago, last Saturday morning on you know if we were talking on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. And we said, okay, the Jets have five games over the next eight. How many? I would have said Lauren Brassois starting two of those five. Uh, but he started zero of them. Now, he did get the one appearance in. So, yeah, I, I, I was a bit surprised when I heard it. Now, game 500, hockey night in Canada, Jets trying to break a five-game streak. And as I mentioned earlier, the deepest lineup of the year with Gabe Velarde's return. I suppose I could buy the idea that all of those factors, you know, big stage of Hockey Night in Canada, um, a Saturday night, and you want your number one goalie to go with your number one lineup. Uh, okay. But yeah, it's it's a bit surprising for sure. Um, I do wonder what this means for the next couple home games. I mean, does does Connor Hellebuck now? I would have originally said, yeah, he for sure starts on Monday against LA. Maybe Lauren Brassois starts that game now. You know, in my eyes, I had figured Brassois would have started tonight and probably also against Calgary next Thursday. Now, I guess he probably just starts one of those two games um, still on the homestand, and I don't know which one it'll be. Um, for those, you know, on the Jennings watch, uh, I believe the Jets and the Panthers are still in a dead heat, right? Because I think, or no, sorry, Panthers are up by a goal. Jets gave up <laughs> four the other day, and the empty netters do count. They don't count against the goalies. They count against the team, though. Mm-hmm. So I believe the Panthers have a one-goal lead with nine games left. Uh, but Lauren Brassois stuck at 20. And after tonight, there's only eight games left. Mm -hmm. Is there a scenario that he's getting in five of the final eight? I mean, unless they they do something a little uh, uh, to game the system by maybe putting him in for like a minute or something, you know, Mm. uh, I just don't see it happening. But I don't know that they're focused. They're that that focused on that record. They're focused, obviously, on how the team's playing as a whole. 
And you you mentioned that they, they have their number one lineup tonight. They're the deepest they've been in a long time. Yeah. Kind of the the guy that's now on the outside looking in is Cole Perfetti, who's been in and out of the lineup. He was in the last three games. Um, but now with Gabe Velarde coming back, you mentioned the fourth line, Baron, Nemestikov, I follow. Perfetti's on the outside looking in. Rick Bonus told us in the Matt Frost Media Center that it's a tough situation for him. They're trying to stay honest with him. Where are you at with Cole Perfetti, and where do you think his season goes from here? If, if the team stays healthy, is he a guy that's game one of the playoffs on the outside looking in? Maybe it's more against a physical team he wouldn't be in there. Where are you at right. with Cole Perfetti, and where do you think the team's at with Cole Perfetti? By the way, just to finish the thought on uh, Brassois and Hellebuck, sure. I see I see Rick Bonus has just said – uh, as because he's speaking while we're doing this, that mm -hmm. uh, Lauren Brassois has a couple of planned starts in Winnipeg's final eight games after tonight. So I take that to mean two. Uh, and so unless there's three relief appearances in there, uh, he's going to ultimately fall short, which would mean if he plays 22, that means Connor Hellebuck would, would start 60 out of the 82. That's That certainly is a heavy workload. And as you said, Dave, it, it's you know it's one thing if they don't have a reliable backup, they mm -hmm. arguably have the best backup in the league. So I am a bit surprised. I suppose that plan could always be subject to change again if the Jets get locked into a playoff spot. Let's just say with four games left, they really can't do anything but finish third. You know, if if they they have enough buffer with Nashville, but they're also too far behind Colorado and Dallas, maybe they change it up. Um, if that's the case, we'll obviously wait and see what that looks like. Uh, for your question, Connor, on on um, Cole Perfetti, yeah, I mean, I think he's just a victim of a numbers game right now. And certainly, I think we've seen his play pick up a little bit here um, in, in the games that he has got in. Like, I looked to that, that game against Washington a couple of weeks ago where he was on the verge of a breakout game, right? He hit two posts. He looked really dangerous. Then he struggled against Nashville. Um, he was out the next game against uh, Anaheim, I believe it was. And then, of course, was sitting to start the road trip. But then he does get back in. He scores that goal, which um, was a pretty meaningless goal in the grand scheme mm -hmm. of the game, but certainly gave him, I think, a shot of confidence that he needed. Uh, but yeah, I mean, guys are healthy. They've made trade deadline ads. And, you know, there's a lot of teams that would look at, his stat line, okay, 32 points, 66 games for a 22-year-old, 15 goals. Like, uh, that's pretty That's pretty deep when that can't get in the lineup. Um, you know, I, I had a good chat with, with Cole last week on the road. I think we were when we were in uh, Long Island, uh, the practice before the Islanders game, and before he was going to get back in that game, and then he scored that next day. He's got a really good head on his shoulders. Um, you know, he he told me that he still very much sees the big picture. He knows the situation right now. Um, he knows he's a big part of this future core. Um, he may not be a part of it right now. I still obviously trying to find his way. And I do think there's something to the fact that, you know, you look back at, at his games played, he has never played this much hockey in a season. Even going back to junior, you know, 2018-19, 63 games with Saginaw. 2019-20, 61. Um, then in 2020-21, he played 32 games with the Moose. 35 games in 21-22 split between the Jets and the Moose. 51 last year. He's up to 66. And for a young player, I, I think he probably hit the wall a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, unless they run into some injuries, there's a good chance we don't see him certainly not to start in the playoffs, um, but maybe this reset and, you know, he's going to be a hungry player if and when he gets another chance. Um, you know, I, I suspect we'd see a very motivated Cole Perfetti if he does get another chance. And and if he doesn't this season, um, I think, you know, next year there's still plenty enough to build on this year as he goes forward in his career here. Mike, one guy who isn't getting demoted, and I mentioned it already, he's played 29 minutes in that last game. Uh, <laughs> and 29th birthday, 29 minutes, I think they were trying to have some sort of uh, uh, parallels there. But, <laughs> right. you know, Josh Morrissey, for a long time, and it was going to be difficult, wasn't looking like he was going to be able to achieve what he had achieved last year. And just because you don't achieve the same level of points doesn't mean you don't have the same level of success. Right. But from what 
he was able to do during this last stretch of probably 15, 20 games to get back to the similar sort of offensive output, maybe not from a goal scoring standpoint, but from at least from an assist where he's, you know, going to go with that 55 to 60 range, most likely. And again, it's not all about points, but is enough made of what, I mean, I know we do, I know you at the free press uh, do, and I know that everybody else in this market pays a lot of attention, but it's, is it not just remarkable what this kid is doing night in, night out for this team? You know, he's as important to this team as Mark Shifley is to the forwards, as Connor Hellebuck is to the goaltending. Again, that's not a particularly insightful comment, right. but it's just, it, it's just amazing to me what he's been able to do because there's, there's a lot of expectation on his shoulders from last year. And I think he's more than met that in what we've seen in his follow-up. Yeah, he really has. And uh, look, I'm not a huge proponent of uh, the value of um, plus minus. You know, it's it's a stat that doesn't have, there's a lot, a lot better ways to measure sure. effectiveness. However, there's got to be something to be said that Josh Morrissey and Dylan DeMello, who play the heaviest minutes, the, the prime matchup, they're out there against McDavid. They're out there against Eichel. You know, go down, you can run through every team. They're out there against the other team's best. Um, not only has he put up 58 points, and with the power play struggles this year, I haven't broken down exactly how many of those are even strength points, but we know, you know, nobody on the Jets is just piling up the points on the power play. Uh, but he's plus 25, which, and again, he's also out there in all the the uh, empty net situation. So even that, like the other night, I didn't look, but he probably got you know, they scored two empty netters the other day. He probably took a minus two just on those alone. Yeah. Uh, Dylan DeMello is plus 39, which is just crazy. Uh, among the best in the NHL, like, um, I think these guys have, the, a tr they're a terrific one-two punch. But Josh Morrissey is for sure the engine um, on that back end. And in a lot of ways, on the front end as well. You know, I, I, I think I tweeted on the road trip, might have been the Rangers game, where I said, like, I don't even think the word defenseman really describes what Josh Morris like is hybrid. doing. You almost yeah. have to start calling him like a rover. Yeah. Because forget about just getting up in the rush, which is something Rick Bonus wants his defenseman to do, and they have the green light to do it. There are many, many times where he is flat out leading the rush, um, conducting himself like a forward. And, you know, we've seen where he'll spend almost the whole shift playing mm -hmm. essentially as a forward. There was a game recently where I think David Gustafson basically played defense for the whole show <laughs> because he was covering for Josh Morrissey. So he's a lot of fun to watch. I mean, an extremely different player, but in some ways, and, and it's fitting because he was a bit of a mentor for him. It's who he was paired with at first. There's some Dustin Bufflin suddenly in Josh Morrissey's game. And uh, yeah, he's, he seems to enjoy the the challenge when his team is down of trying to pick them up, um, and you know he's been everything you could have asked for for sure. He's he's not going to get probably to his or he won't get to his point total of seventy six last year. Not unless he, I guess, he could get eighteen over the next nine two points a game he'd need to average. But fifty eight mm -hmm. points still, um, you know, he's he's hit the fifty assist mark again, and you know for everything he does, it's uh, it's been a real treat to watch. Um, and the Jets are going to need a lot more of that uh, starting in the playoffs from him. Well, it's been a real treat to have you on the show today, Mike. We always appreciate your time and your insights here whenever you join us on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Fun stuff, guys. We uh, we will see you, uh, I guess, in a few hours up in the press box. Mm -hmm. We will <laughs> indeed. We will indeed. Anyways, All thanks right. very much for joining us, Mike. We appreciate it. Enjoy there he the goes. Day. That's Mike McIntyre of the Winnipeg Free Press. You can catch his stuff alongside his his apparently his work wife ken weeb who now he doesn't have to worry well they don't get to go on the road together but when he's at the arena i'm sure that they get a chance to uh he reminds him of the things that he's missing keeps him honest as kenny likes to say kept me the honest the other day when i inadvertently said uh what did i say i said oh the health i called uh gabriel velarde a healthy scratch which right. actually in retrospect actually was an accurate uh, statement because he was healthy but he was yep. a non-participant which is how i changed it thanks to ken keeping me honest and ken Speaking of Ken, and actually we'll jump off of Ken in a sec. We'll go to the break. It's Ken, It was Ken's 49th birthday. That's a big milestone for yes. uh, Weaver earlier this week. But more importantly, with all due respect to Ken, Zeta Sam, my my grandfather, he turns 97 today. Wow. So, yeah, he's amazing. 
just a, a really it still drives, still does everything. My my grandmother, my Baba, she's still alive too. So she's turning wow. 97 in September. But my grandparents still going, still going strong, awesome. showing us what it's what it what it takes to 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 make life work. And so he is his celebrating What's his the secret? 70th. Um what we gotta ask, what's the secret? I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, he just he lived a good life. I mean, he's continues to live yeah. a good life. You know, he just yeah. he doesn't stress about things. And that's uh, that that's the key. Yeah, they've been married for 73 years, I think. So uh wow. they're yeah, they're 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 killing it. They've been done a real good job. And like yeah. I said, uh he's an inspiration. We had him for dinner at my parents last night, and uh yeah, it's pretty it's pretty awesome. So that is uh, awesome. happy birthday to Zeta Sam. And uh, thanks very much, all of you, for joining us. We are going to head to commercial break. And when we come back, Connor and I will continue to talk about a little subject called the Winnipeg Jets. So we'll be back right after these words from our sponsors. Keeping Winnipeg laughing for over 30 years. Rumors, Canada's longest-running comedy club, bringing you the biggest laughs from the best comedians on the planet. Jerry Seinfeld, Chris Rock, John Stewart, Dennis Miller, Brad Garrett, the greats, and all the up-and-comers, too. When was the last time you laughed out loud? Make it a great night out with friends or book your office or birthday party, even a fundraising event at Rumors. Get all the details and dates on upcoming shows at RumorsComedyClub.com. Whoa, Ezzy, everything okay? You look stressed. Of course I'm stressed. We're moving, the house is upside down, the kids failed miserably at packing the fine china, and my life is in chaos. Chaos! Yes, that does sound like a problem. What am I going to do? Ezzy, relax. Rolly's transfer moving and storage is the answer. With 60 years of experience in moving Manitobans and a track record of exemplary customer service, one call to Rolly's and your stress is gone. No job is too big or too small. Just visit rollies.com and they will take it from there. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Rollies Transfer Moving and Storage, online at rollies.com. Hey, Drew. Ezzy, whoa, what a smile. Yeah, I got my crowns done at Linden Market Dental Center and they whiten my teeth. I see. They're so bright that every time I smile, they go, We have hockey tonight. Do you have a mouth guard to protect those pearly whites? I sure do. Whoa, they even ting through the mouth guard. Linden Market Dental Center covers all your dental needs from restorative to cosmetic dentistry and will fit you with a sports guard for that active lifestyle. 877 Waverly. See LindenMarketDental.com. Boston Pizza harnessed Fatalytics to test if the game is better at home or at Boston Pizza. The results are irrefutable. Catch the game at Boston Pizza. Powered by Fatalytics. We did it again. You're on fire, man. There's power in a handshake. After a great game or great deal, it shows professionalism and respect. Two quality Zapia Group Realty take pride in. You don't build a business where 95% of your clients are referred by others without honesty, integrity, and total dedication to client satisfaction. To sell your home for more in less time, shake hands with Frank and Mauro Zappia of Zappia Group Realty. Get started at zappiagroup.com. Welcome back to the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. I just actually called my Zeta to wish him happy birthday officially, even though I wished him last night. And I said, Zeta, everybody in the chat wants to know what's your what's your secret? And his, his secret was make sure you keep your partner happy. And that's your secret to a long life is to always make sure that uh, he or she is a happy individual. And then therefore you can have happiness. And I think that makes there you a lot of sense. So that's, it that's, does. that is your happiness. If you have a partner, of course, if you don't, then you don't have to then just focus on yourself. But anyways, <laughs> uh, let's talk about someone who's maybe not the happiest and that's fine. You know, you don't want to like, again, um, moose head coach, former moose head coach, sorry, current Columbus blue jackets head coach, Pascal Vincent used to say he doesn't want guys to be happy. If they're not in the lineup, he doesn't want, he doesn't want them to pout, but he doesn't mm-hmm. expect anybody. Like when they got sent down to the AHL, he didn't say, okay, well, you know, you should be happy that you're in the AHL guys will be happy to mm-hmm. play. Like I, I, you know, I, I've talked to Dominic Tonato who would of course would rather be in the NHL than the AHL. But at the end of the day, these guys, Jonathan Harkins, I remember all these guys who say, I just want to play hockey. Maybe even David Gustafson, yeah. just an opportunity to play. <clears throat> and so yeah. that was, but, but they also at the same time wanted more talked about it with Billy Hainola. I say, it's no secret. Why you don't have to like, it would be a problem if you're like, yeah, no, I'm cool with the AHL. Like, again, mm-hmm. you can't be unrealistic. You have to be realistic in your expectations. And I think Mike touched on it to your, to your question, Connor. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit here to start the second half of this, of the illegal curve hockey show. But 
I, I do wonder about Cole Perfetti because we live in a society and I've said this before, this has been my rant. And I, this is why I always take a long view when it comes to prospects. And I don't think you need to rush them. You know, Brad yep. Lambert, who didn't play last night. I don't know why he didn't play yesterday in the game because I wasn't able to stay because I had my grandfather's birthday. So I yeah. didn't get a chance to stay. I stayed for the game, final buzzer, but then I had to leave. So we'll talk about the moose mm-hmm. in a little bit. But I, I guess what I'm going to say is that, like, you know, folks want to r- rush Brad Lambert, Nikita Chibrikov, you know, all these guys. And, and, and don't get me wrong. I think you give them a shot but they don't need to be rushed into an uh, into a situation that's not advantageous for them. You want to put your prospects in the best situation possible. And I think that quite honestly, I think with Cole Perfetti's kind of hitting that ceiling, I don't think it's a bad thing for him to be able to have some like remove some of that pressure because at mm-hmm. the end of the day, Cole Perfetti's not a fourth line guy. Like that fourth no. line composition of Nemesnikov, uh Baron and Ifalo, I think is a perfect fourth line. Yeah. And I just think that you know, Cole Perfetti, I know everybody wants him to have success. He's a 2020 draft pick. And remember, he's 20. Now, he had the benefit of playing the AHL when he shouldn't have been because he was too young. Right. But at the same time, even that was a shortened season. And it was a bizarre kind of like that all Canadian division where literally they were playing for one person. Yeah. Yours truly, yeah. the only person who I didn't work <laughs> for the team was watching those games over at the, well, at the time called the Iceplex. But I just think like he's one of those players that I, I just don't think that there's cause for concern. He has, look, he has things he has to work on. He has to work on his speed. He has to work on his strength. Mm-hmm. You don't have to work on his hockey IQ. He doesn't have to work on his shot. Well, I mean, everybody no. works on the shot, but like he, he's got the tools. There's just some things he needs to add to the toolbox in order to become a more complete player and a player like we just talked about, who's going to be able to play 82 games. And your hope is, you know, 16 plus games in the Stanley Cup finals or playoffs, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also like Mike touched on it there as well. He's a, he hasn't played this much hockey in his career ever. Uh, we know Rick Bonus says, everyone says the games get tougher down the stretch. Maybe he's just simply hit the wall. And at the end of the day, like he thrived in a top six role for the first half of the season. Like mm-hmm. he killed it. Like 15 goals, like that's that's really good. And he found chemistry with Nikolai Ehlers at times. And um, Vladislav Nemesikov, th- that line played well as a second line for Winnipeg. They, that was that was their line when they were winning yeah. the, on the big winning streak, right? And Cole Perfetti at twenty at the time, twenty one. Now he's twenty two. Being a top six contributor and con- and thriving in a top six role at that age is yeah. should be enough. And then now we can just kind of shrug our shoulders and say, well, he hit the wall. Uh, this team's incredibly deep. They added both Monahan and Toffoli. The fourth line, Baron, I have followed Nemesnikov. It's a great fourth line. Um, and sometimes, you know, it, it just happens. Like Mike alluded to the numbers game. Um, sometimes young players just get left on the outside. That's not to say that he's not going to get in a game down the stretch or he might not be a player in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, don't, like I, I guess it's the don't miss the forest for the trees. Like he's he clearly showed signs of progression this season and showed that he can play in a top six role. And he hit the wall because he's a young player who hasn't played this much. Yeah. And for the next decade, maybe five to 10 years, Cole Perfetti is going to be a player for the Jets and he's going to be in a top six role. Um, maybe now is not the time because like we said, they have the deepest team they've had in a long time. Um, but I think the first half of the season when he was in the top six role and he killed it is enough like tangible results to the point where you can point to that and say at the end of the season, when the season's over and say, hey, look, Cole Perfetti might be a top six guy for us next year. Um, I'd say he starts in the top six next year, unless they bring everyone back somehow miraculously. Yeah. We know uh, that's not going to happen though. Of course. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I think he's in a top six role next year. So I, I don't think the organization is down on him. Um, anything like that. It's just the numbers game. He's hit a wall. And even when he came in for the three games there, I thought he played great. That's why when he came out of the lineup against Vegas, uh, I asked Rick bonus about him, like kind of where are you at with him now that you've seen him play after giving him a rest. Um, and he basically had this very long winded, great answer on how they set Kucherov in Tampa when he was a rookie. Um, it's tough on a young player that the games get tougher. Um, and, and they, they say he's a talented player and what you talked about where players don't want to, uh, be in the press box. They don't, he said Cole Perfetti pushed back and like kind of showed, um, he was angry towards that decision. And Rick mm-hmm. Bonus was like, I love that. I want to see the pushback. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, Rick bonus loves the pushback. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, but he likes to see the players like upset that they're not playing. And he said, everyone wants to play 20 minutes a night. Can't happen. 
but you like to see Cole Perfetti not happy with the decision to keep him out of the lineup. And I think, yeah, next year he'll be a top six guy because he showed that he can do it. He hit the wall, happens, numbers game. Um, he might even be a player down the stretch, but I I couldn't be happier with how Cole Perfetti's season went, especially the first half. But yeah, hit the wall. It happens. Happens in pro sports. Yeah, and look, it it we've talked about it, like I said today, to start the show. This is one of the deepest teams from a forward perspective. I still don't think they're as deep as the 17-18 team defensively. Absolutely. I think they've not, I think yeah. they've played well, but they're you can't compare those two teams. I mean, that team kills this team, I think, in terms of a defensive juggernaut. Yeah. But but when you look at the forward group at this, and we've just talked about it, and we've rolled, we I went through it line by line of what mm-hmm. the way you know Cole Perfetti. And I just had, I just saw the comment. I don't know if I didn't highlight it, but it's, it's, I think it was prime timer. Maybe not, but it, oh, no, I think it was prime timer. Hold on. Let me, let me get to it. One sec. Good prime timer. timer. Good, got, good memory by me. The credit. There we go. We need a top nine and a bottom three. And I agree with that, right? You do need that. That's how the you Jets need... like run their lines, really, with the Lowry line being basically like the second line all season long. That well, is really how they, they run things. And the one guy who was pilloried. I've used that word a few times already today, but it's kind of true. And, it, and look, that's what you expect in a fan base that cares, right? Like this is a fan yes. base that cares. And so the amount of people who get mad online, which is amazing, but like the amount of people who get mad online for just like writing, like I'm not even joking. Someone got, someone got said they were unfollowing us because the headline was the powerless power play. Uh, and I was like, well, what part of that wasn't true? They went over for five. Too negative, like, Dave, too yeah, negative. I'm like, Come okay, on. well, I guess that's true. But, uh, I guess, you know, like I said, unfortunately, facts don't care about your feelings and uh, them, them's were the facts. But, you know, this is this is like I said, it's it's a deep team. It's an opportunity for Perfetti to, you know, again, he can he can marinate in this. And he can get pissed off and he can use it to his advantage. And, and look, you know, getting that goal against the Islanders, even though it was from like, you know, 30, 40 feet away, it yeah. was still important because, you know, it, it got him feeling like he was a part of it. And and at the end of the day. You want this team, like, again, like that's always the hard team, hard thing about the trade deadline and the concept, right? You're bringing yeah. all these guys, you're bringing all these guys in who are going to be new additions, right? And you're like, oh, you got mm-hmm. Brian Tyler Foley, got Sean Monahan, But what about the guys who got you there, right? Like that's yeah. the, that's the, that's the thing that I always find it's, it's difficult, right? Like we've talked about it when this team was rolling without Kyle Connor, you had guys like Dominic Connato and Axel Janssen Fielby being contributors and feeling they were like they were part of this team and now they're relegated to doing things with the moose and we'll talk about what yeah. the moose are doing and how they've gone on a run of their own to force their way back into the playoff conversation mm-hmm. right connor but like yeah again it's 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 a it's a delicate balancing act that a coach has to kind of walk to absolutely you know, yeah. you know again these guys all have ego and they don't get there without ego that's the thing right like so so it's all it's a, it's a fine it's a fine, not an easy thing to be a manager. Someone, some yeah. kid yesterday asked me if I was the manager of the Winnipeg Jets because I was in my suit at practice, <laughs> which is unusual for me. Everybody did you say yes? I did. I didn't. I, oh, didn't. Okay. I, I, oh. I just kept walking. But I said, no, unfortunately, I'm not. Not only that, I'm not even the manager of Illegal Curve, let alone the manager of the <laughs> Winnipeg Jets. But he saw me in my suit, whereas everybody else was uh, more casual yesterday. But of course, I was going to the Moose game right after Jets practice. And it was funny because I had a few folks say to me, Sorry, Dave, I didn't say hello. I didn't recognize you. You weren't wearing a hat, so it didn't yeah. look like you. So I understood that there was a, a cause a little confusion yesterday at Hockey for All Center. But, you know, like I said, we'll round out the, the dialogue about um, Cole Perfetti. And I, I, I just think, like, he, he's, he's got a lot of runway. He's got a lot of yeah. time. And he's going to make a tremendous impact on this Winnipeg Jets team. He's got things he's got to work on. But he's young. Mm. He'll have that opportunity. And like, it's like anything, like any player, right? If And he like Shifley, every guy who has to work on their game, every guy has to go into the off season and do something to get better in some area. And it's all about finding the margins, right? It's all about finding yeah. that small degree of percentage where you can find improvement. And Cole Perfetti has, he knows what he needs to do. And the things thing is, you know, you could say this guy's got all the talent in the world, but he doesn't have the hockey sense. Perfetti has the hockey sense. So you don't have to worry about right. it in that regard. So you know right. that again, the desire, and maybe this lights that fire. Maybe this is the the maybe. thing that maybe he doesn't see a, a game in the playoffs. Who knows? We don't know. We're not. We don't know what this what the future will bring. But at mm. the same time, at the end of the day, I think it's 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 just it's the right decision for the player, and it's the right decision for the team. And I think you you brought up the trade deadline. I don't think the Jets go out and inquire to fully if 
Perfetti didn't struggle up until mm-hmm. that point. Like I think I think if Perfetti was still playing as good as he was the first half of the year going into the trade deadline, that final stretch where he struggled, I don't think they'd go out and spend assets on a Tyler Toffoli because they would have had faith that Perfetti can be a top six guy or anyone on the fourth line right now. And I follow and a Mesikov, a Baron um, could step up at which Morgan Baron hasn't gotten a promotion all year. I find that kind of interesting, but especially considering he, he already has a career high in goals with less ice time per yeah. game than he did last that, that, year. That's, that's another conversation, but Morgan barron has been fantastic from the fourth line. Um, but Connor, Nemesikov Connor, and I the, follow. Connor, Connor, the, the world's our oyster. If you want to talk about Morgan <laughs> Barron, let's talk about Morgan <laughs> Barron. Go yeah. for it. Well, well, first of all, you, you brought up the fact that fans get mad about the, the 13th forward. Here we are in the Illegal Cup Hockey Show ta- spending time talking about the 13th forward in the fourth line. I love it. I love it. This yeah. is this is what Canadian hockey market is is, is all about. But anyways, um, where was I at? Cole Perfetti. Yeah, the, the deadline. I don't think they go out and spend assets on to Foley if Perfetti's not struggling into that time frame, And uh, yeah, I, I said it before, like they don't re-sign to Foley this off season. I don't think he's going to command a high price tag among contenders. Um, and that opens up a spot for a Perfetti um, or a Rucker McGordy in the bottom six to fill in. Um, and, and Rucker McGordy also, this is another layer to this conversation. You look at how deep the Jets lineup is all along. We've been talking about, if Rucker McGordy is going to make an impact. And I, I I think he still might sign and maybe get into a game here down the stretch, but does he play in the playoffs given what the lineup is right now? I don't think so. Um, But Perfetti. Yes. I think we're on the same page. He's going to be a great player for the Winnipeg Jets. It might just take a little bit longer than people were hoping, but for a smaller player who's not the fastest, um, but has like elite, elite, elite of the elite hockey sense. Um, I, I think it's fine that it's taking that long because like you said, that's, that's unteachable stuff is the hockey sense. You can, you can get stronger. You can get faster. You can't teach, um, making a pass cross seam through four sticks of defenders, which he did on multiple occasions this year. He's, he's, he's the smart, one of the smartest players in the jets forward group. Um, and yeah, it might light a fire under his, under his tail. And if in the off season, he goes, well, I didn't play a playoff game, so I got to earn it. And he gets faster and he gets stronger and he's in a top six role and he's even better next year. Like that's, that's a great scenario for the jets. So it's kind of take a deep breath on Cole Perfetti. Um, yes, he's a very talented player, but um, if he doesn't get in games down the stretch here, I well provided the jets don't mightily struggle. Like if they can't score goals then Perfetti should get back in. But um, yeah, I, I think he's going to be a great player. And I think we're on the same page with that. Well, and, and you know, it's funny you mentioned Rutger McGordy and, Again, yeah. typical, everybody's like, well, he's going to jump from college and he's going to immediately have an impact. And it's funny because I talked to someone who covers college and this was their comment. He's a good player, but stepping into the NHL midseason is something only a very few people could do. And I don't think he's that. So that's from someone who watches college. I'm not a, I don't mm. follow the college game to any significant degree. I would disagree. Time. I would disagree with that comment that he's a good player because I think he's a great player. Well, I, like I think, I think, the- I think what he, I think what he's suggesting is that as good as a player as he is, he's not going to be able to just okay, translate yes. his game immediately to the, he has been like fantastic. Everything you could have hoped for that Michigan team this year. And from a Jets no question, perspective, like yeah, he's, for sure. he's been absolutely dominant. Yeah. And I was going to say the only, the only time I ever significantly watched the NCAA was, mm-hmm. uh, Kyle Connors one year at Michigan where I pretty much watched every single game. And I was like, this kid is unbelievable and and mm-hmm. the things he was doing for the wolverines was ridiculous but uh actually i think and in fact kyle connor and um Mor- mason appleton were gonna have some beef because i believe aren't uh, michigan state and michigan playing each other upcoming is that the next i believe so because michigan just beat north dakota four yeah. three i believe Came it was last year the night before yeah, yeah. yeah. No, last night yeah okay um yeah so that set yeah there you go beef you're gonna have to ask about that dave yeah. So, and, and, and again, remember just, but just, but just to be clear when Kyle Connor and I, I see, um, I think it was like Ken or Joe, I don't, let me just see which one who made that comment, but like, you know, Kenny's water bottle said NCAA to NHL are a few steps apart. KFC was a whole yes. Baker finalist and had to spend time on the moose first. So remember Absolutely. he went up yeah. to the jets, everybody was excited. Then went down to the moose and he quite frankly didn't do much with the moose until he got it. And then he, then the spark was ignited. And that's what you do with players. That's where you put them. Look, Patrick Liney is a special player. Remember, Mark Shifley went back to junior twice before he made mm-hmm. a, a permanent impact with the Winnipeg Jets. So I know that everybody wants these guys to, to jump in and they say, well, this guy's different. This guy's made different. 
that's wonderful, but it's just not very realistic, especially like we're not talking about one of the guys on the back end. If we're talking about like, if you had a, a majority type on the back end, you could say, okay, well maybe, but like mm-hmm. on, uh, as a forward from this forward group, I, who are you taking out? You're taking yeah. out any of these guys. Really? I don't see it. I just don't see it for a guy. Who's the only played- one, the only one I could hear out is Mason Appleton, but Rick bonus isn't going to do that because he's that third line's been together all year. Not and only that, he, he's, he loves like, that he's on your, he's, not only that, he plays PK. Like there's just, they're not taking out Mason right. Appleton. Yeah. So like, again, it, it's, and we don't even, for the record, we don't even know if record McGordy is signing a contract. Right. That's right. The other thing because, that, you know, he could yeah. be captain of Michigan next year. And that may be a big factor. And I know Jets fans don't like to hear that, but it's not, it's possible he doesn't sign a deal next year or this, sorry, I should say when his this season year. comes to yeah. an end. So, so, I mean, again, it's all well and good to be putting these people into positions, but we don't even know what he's going to do. So, I mean, again, there's like Brad Lambert's older than Rucker McGordy and, or not by much, but like, you know, marginally, I think, but like the point is, I, I meant, I guess, older from a perspective of playing pro hockey, right? He was playing mm-hmm. pro hockey in, in Finland. He went, obviously went back and played junior last year, He's played a full season with the pros. And that's a totally mm-hmm. different animal. It just is like, again, I know college hockey is there's, there's older players. It's bigger, but at the same time, like pro hockey is, is just a different, is a different level up. Like, like, yeah. uh, like we just heard For from sure. Waddle Waddle. And and yeah, hundred percent agree. And Rutgers, the type of player that you see this progress that he's made and the type of style of game that he plays and his frame and that he plays like a man, like he's, he's going to adjust to the pro game. Well, when that time comes, uh, yeah, <laughs> well, I, I'd push back on that. Jay Miller, actually, I, I wouldn't appreciate that. No, um, but, but Connor's got, like, Connor's got some fight. See, that's what you want to see. You want to see that pushback. <laughs> that's what you want to see, Dave. Yeah. I um, but I, I think this whole conversation, you bring up Brad Lambert as well. Like Perfetti, Lambert, and McGordy are the future of the Jets. Um, yep. And and they've all had great seasons in their own way. Like mm-hmm. I remember Murata Tesh uh, from The Athletic who was on WST saying that Lambert has had like the perfect season in terms of his development in the sense that he's the guy for the Moose. Um, like he's one of their key cogs offensively. And they struggled for a long time. And now... They're not struggling. They're winning a lot of games. And he's been at the forefront of both of those like kind of emotional swings. He's gone through a pro season now as a center where they've struggled. And he's the guy that kind of has to like pull them out of that because he's the offensive driver. And then you you get, go on this long winning streak where he's still the offensive driver and he's still playing great. So I think in terms of Perfetti, his first half of the season and him hitting the wall, Lambert going through the emotional swings of the moose season and being the, the guy offensively the, the whole time, excuse me. And then Rucker McGordy being one of the points leaders in the NCAA while being like a power forward type of player. Um, I don't think you could have asked for more out of those three guys this season and Jets fans should be extremely excited for the future of this team. Um, but right now the players are who the players are. And this, this lineup we're seeing tonight, I think, Maybe on the back end, on the third pairing, there might be a little bit of a change. But this is the lineup you're going to see game one, round one of the playoffs. Um, and and Perfetti, Lambert, I know people want to see Lambert up, but no, McGrory, like the, these guys aren't a part of the the playoff lineup, I don't think, barring something drastic happening. I Well, I mean, I definitely agree with you. And again, like I said, the reality is you're going to give these guys an opportunity. Like, look, if, if McGrory signs, send him to the Moose. Let him be a player for the Moose. We've seen it enough times. In the playoffs, yeah. Of course, we've seen guys get opportunities. The Moose do that. They give these guys these opportunities to go in and play big games in in the playoffs, playoff games. Like, you'll see a guy and he'll join, like, Parker Ford played games last year, right? So, and look at, I mean, he's a good example, right? Parker Ford, remember, remember, folks, just to be clear, Parker Ford, his first year out of college, technically, because last, like I said, he joined the Moose at the end. Everybody wanted him to be the 13th forward. I haven't heard Parker Ford's name once since the preseason since legend. He was everybody. Yeah. This guy's going to be our 13th forward. This guy's going to be our 13th forward. Where's Parker Ford? Now I'll tell you what Parker Ford is doing. He scored 15 goals for the moose. And he's part of an, a, you know, an, a very similar line to the Lowry line. I call it the identity line. And we'll do a little moose talk in about uh, 25 minutes. So we'll end the show that way, Connor. But sure. I'm just saying that it's, 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 I understand that po- folks want guys to be there, that instant gratification. You drafted them, developed them for a bit, and now, but you can't gloss over the, the development part. 
right? Mm-hmm. If, if, if Parker Ford doesn't get this chance to learn the ups and downs of being a pro, Parker Ford could be a player for the Jets next year. But right now, he's become an important piece of that Jeffrey VL, Christian Reichel line that sets the tone for the Manitoba Moose. Got to tell you, a lot more important than being a fringe NHLer who sits in the press box or practices with the team. That's mm-hmm. all I'm going to say. So we're going to we're going to leave that Jets talk there. Well, uh, unless you want to jump in, no, you can jump one in. One last thing. Time. One last thing. Yes, I, 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 from a fan perspective, like I 100% get the the want to have these guys in the lineup. Rekko McGrady is going to be an incredibly exciting player. Like he had that huge hit in the gold medal game, um, USA, Sweden, Sweden yeah. guy cut to the middle of the ice. He absolutely crushed him shoulder to chest, like perfect hit. Um, he's the captain. We know his off ice personality. Like I don't blame people for him wanting to be signed and be here immediately. I want him absolutely. to be here and be signed immediately. That would be amazing. I don't blame people for Brad Lambert wanting to be up because he's his on ice. Like he's an incredibly exciting. He's another Nikolai Ehlers. Like they're so exciting. The skating, um, making people miss off the rush and, and doing, making highlight real goals and things of that nature. And then Cole Perfetti with the hockey sense that we, we mentioned, like, I don't, these young players are exciting and to have them in the lineup would be amazing to watch them play Winnipeg Jets hockey. And that is coming and they are the future of this team. But yeah, for right now, the, the focus is, is on the, the 12 forwards in the lineup tonight, because I think that's the, the game one playoff lineup. There you go. The final word goes to Connor Rapjack. Well, at least for now, we'll get back to more final words from yours truly. And we're going to welcome Alex Adams. He's making his Saturday show debut. He's writes for the hockey news and he covers the Ottawa senators. So we're going to set things up because of course the jets and senators are playing tonight at six o'clock here in Winnipeg. Kyle will be not Connor Herabjik's 500th NHL game, but it will be Connor Hellebuck's 500th NHL game. He gets the start for the Jets against the Sens. So uh, a lot of fun. We're already having the show is flying by Connor. We're already an hour and a half into it. We'll come we'll head to the break. And then when we come back, we'll uh, have some Sens talk with Alex Adams. Keeping Winnipeg laughing for over 30 years. Rumors, Canada's longest running comedy club, bringing you the biggest laughs from the best comedians on the planet. Jerry Seinfeld, Chris Rock, John Stewart, Dennis Miller, Brad Garrett, the greats, and all the up and comers too. When was the last time you laughed out loud? Make it a great night out with friends or book your office or birthday party. Even a fundraising event at Rumors. Get all the details and dates on upcoming shows at rumorscomedyclub.com. Whoa, Ezzy, everything okay? You look stressed. Of course I'm stressed. We're moving, the house is upside down, the kids failed miserably at packing the fine china, and my life is in chaos. Chaos! Yes, that does sound like a problem. What am I going to do? Ezzy, relax. Rolly's transfer moving and storage is the answer. With 60 years of experience in moving Manitobans and a track record of exemplary customer service, one call to Rollies and your stress is gone. No job is too big or too small. Just visit rollies.com and they will take it from there. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Rollies Transfer Moving and Storage, online at rollies.com. Hey, Drew. Ezzy, whoa, what a smile. Yeah, I got my crowns done at Linden Market Dental Center and they whiten my teeth. I see. They're so bright that every time I smile, they go... We have hockey tonight. Do you have a mouth guard to protect those pearly whites? I sure do. Whoa, they even ting through the mouth guard. Linden Market Dental Center covers all your dental needs, from restorative to cosmetic dentistry, and will fit you with a sports guard for that active lifestyle. 877 Waverly. See LindenMarketDental.com. Boston Pizza harnessed Fanalytics to test if the game is better at home or at Boston Pizza. The results are irrefutable. Catch the game at Boston Pizza. Powered by Fanalytics. We did it again. You're on fire, man. There's power in a handshake. After a great game or great deal, it shows professionalism and respect. Two qualities Zapia Group Realty take pride in. You don't build a business where 95% of your clients are referred by others without honesty, integrity, and total dedication to client satisfaction. To sell your home for more in less time, shake hands with Frank and Mauro Zappia of Zappia Group Realty. Get started at zappiagroup.com.
Welcome back. I just muted myself. That was an Ezzy move, but welcome back to the Illegal Curve Hockey Show, the final half an hour here on the program. Connor, the time flies when you're having fun, does it not? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Having a great time. Thanks for well, having me on for the, this the is, debut. This, this has been a blast. Not, yeah. yeah, it's been your Saturday show debut, but to be clear, right. Connor, of course, has been on the post game show with me before. So uh, Connor is becoming a wily vet. We haven't quite stolen stolen you from WST, but uh we'll we'll see if we can get there. For now, though. <laughs> We head out east to talk to Alex Adams. Hey, Alex, how are you? Great. Thanks so much for having me on. A big fan of the show and uh, cool to be alongside Connor, who, uh, you know, we've become friends for the last little bit on uh, Jets Twitter. So it's uh, it's really uh, a lot of fun to join the show. Well, we appreciate you joining us uh, here. The Jets, of course, taking on the Senators in Winnipeg at 6 o'clock Central Time. Let's talk about the Senators because, of course, that's a team that you cover for the Hockey News. And uh, from your perspective, we know it's been a bad season. We know it's been a tough season in Ottawa. Uh, of late, though, they've reeled off four wins, the Devils, the uh, Oilers, I believe the Sabres, and the, uh, who was it? It was back. Oh, the Hawks. So yeah. four straight against those teams. What have you in your thoughts, the takeaway, I mean, obviously a little too little too late, but just kind of your impression, what kind of team the Jets fans can expect to see uh, in the Senators Club tonight? A pretty uh, loose and free team. Obviously, as you mentioned, uh, they're not going to be making the playoffs for the seventh consecutive year. Um, they've got good goaltending the last couple games. They've only given up more than three goals once um, against the Oilers. So they've, they've been playing much better defensively. Um, and all season, they haven't got goaltending. And uh, right now, uh, they are getting some goaltending. They had a shutout on uh, in their last game against Chicago. They've been running with Jonas Corposalo. He's been playing well. But, um, yeah, they, they've been good. Tim Stutz has been playing really well. The line of Pinto, Kachuk, and Batherson have been really um, putting it together. But I think it's at this time, for most Sens fans, it's always too little too late. And then they start winning when it's the games don't matter and, they can be free and easy. So, yeah, it's it's. I think this team is some is a team that the Jets should be a bit worried about because they have the talent to put it all together, and they are right now. Um, and obviously, the Jets have been sliding, so it'll be a tough matchup. And um, if the, if they can do well on special teams, the Sens have um, the thirtieth worst um, PK. That's an area where with Velarde back, that could be an area where the the Jets could capitalize. Um, and also, if you get an early goal on Jonas Corposalo, uh, the tides could change pretty quickly. I I find that funny. It's like the battle of two narratives because here in Winnipeg, it's always the, the sky-high first half of the season followed by the second half collapse for whatever reasons that might be. In Ottawa, it's the opposite. It's the lowest of the lows for the first half of the season. And then, like you mentioned, um, the back half of the year, they play free, they play loose, and they, they start winning games. Is that like a, a thing that's happened? It's happened a few times here in Winnipeg, the collapse. Is that something that's happened like a, a good handful of times where you can point to that and say, hey, they're going to do this every year um, unless things change mightily? The, the thing is their starts have been so bad the last four mm -hmm. years that just playing 500 hockey, uh, which they have done <laughs> this year since Maltain, I think they're 21, 21 and 4. So not a great record, but, you know, that's a decent team. Um, in 2020, uh, with Matt Murray uh, in the C Canadian division, they were terrible to start the year. Uh, in 2021, they were too. Last year, I think they were 4-12-0 to start the season. So they've just started the season so poorly and then reg regained some ground and, and started playing free hockey. So, yes, I think uh, in a weird way, um, <laughs> the, the, these two teams are pretty much opposites. Uh, the the nice thing for Jets fans is you get to to experience the playoffs uh, here in Ottawa. We never get that, so it, it's a bit of a different yeah. experience. Um, so uh, I wouldn't be complaining too much about on this five game losing streak for the Jets. But yeah, I, I would say um, it will be one of those games where it's a bit of a trap game because the Sens have the talent to really push the Jets. Stutzla has been playing better of late. Um, Drake Batherson as well. So um, it's going to be an interesting affair. You know, Alex, they, they made the decision to relieve DJ Smith in December uh, of his coaching duties and Jacques Martin, who, which you just touched on, took over. And of course, uh, longtime captain Daniel Alfredson has, has assumed a role as the assistant coach. So what are you seeing from them? And, and do you get the sense? I mean, again, Jacques Martin, I can't remember how old he is, but he's getting up there in age. Not quite as old as Rick Bonus, 69 years, but he's getting there. 
And, you know, not that, you know, age is not just a number, but do you think that there's any chance that Daniel Alfredson becomes the full-time coach uh, in Ottawa? That's a great question because he spoke to the media a couple days ago, um, last week, and he was asked that. And he said basically that he didn't think that he really was that interested in it. He said, well, you know, I'm focused on the season. We'll see when time comes. But then he said he's liking coaching more than he previously thought when entering it. So um, I would be surprised, to say the least, if he became the next coach of the Senators. But I would also not be surprised if he were to, let's say, they bring in Craig Berube. I'm just making a name out there. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he stays on as an assistant just because he's getting a bit of the the coaching niche, um, being around the team. And then what's interesting, you talk about uh, Shaq Malte. He's actually older than Rick Bonus. He's in, I think he's 70. Uh, uh-huh. And he's never on the ice with the players. Um, it's always Daniel Alfredson mm-hmm. leading the charge um, with a couple of the other assistant coaches like Jack Capuano. So it's a very different um, experience, obviously, when the head coach is never on the ice uh, compared to, obviously, Jets practice and the, all 31 other teams. Um, but they have been playing better defensively uh, since um, Maltain's come into to charge. They have better expected goals against. Um, they yeah. still haven't got the goaltending and – that at the end of the day, as good as you you know you can play in front of goalie, if they can't make the saves, you're not going to win a lot of games in the NHL. Well, goaltending, yeah. From an outsider's perspective, it looks like the goaltending has just completely derailed the Senators' season. What do you like? I want to ask about some of their top guys. Tim Stutzla on a long-term deal had a great year last year. Um, Brady Kachuk, we know he's the captain and he's he's always willing to drop the gloves and has a few games where he'll have two goals in a fight and just a, a force. Um, the top guys for Ottawa, have they kind of taken another step forward? I know it's a young core, but when you look at Stutzla, when you look at Josh Norris, he's out for the year once again. Shane Pinto missed the first half of the season and Brady Kachuk. Um, and then even maybe touching on the back end, Jake Sanderson, I know, has had a great mm-hmm. follow-up season. Um, kind of the young core for Ottawa, where where are you at with their, with their core, especially Stutzla and Sanderson? Uh, with, with Stutz and Sand, I'd say they've probably taken a step back, truthfully. I think mm-hmm. going into this season, you would have expected them, one, just to be a better team. And they haven't produced yeah. the way they expected. I think Stutz has been dealing with like a, a nagging injury this season. And that's why his, especially his goal totals are much lower. He had 39 this year. I think he has 18 mm-hmm. this season. Um, and Brady Kachuk, I, th- I think this team has been immature, truthfully. Um, especially to start the season, right? And and that's where you see them. They they had a stretch where they kept giving up two, three goals in the second period. They'd be in a game, and then all of a sudden, for five minutes, they turn their brains off, and the other team would score a couple goals, right? And that's been really the the season for them, where they're they're in games, they're playing competitively, and then things go wrong and it, it it falls like a ton of bricks, right? And so I think that speaks to their lack of maturity. Um, I think you have seen definitely some changes under Maltain where they've been better at holding on to leads. Uh, they didn't have they had only one comeback win under DJ Smith uh, in this season in the third period, and they've had a couple more this season. But yeah, I, I think this group is really young. Uh, Jacob Trickern was talking to us about I think two weeks ago, and he said we need more leaders to step up, and it can't just be always Claude Giroux. And if you look at this team yeah. outside of Giroux, almost everyone is under 26. Thomas Shabbat's a veteran. I think he's 26 or 27 now, right? Mm-hmm. So they don't have that core of guys that have been through the battles, been through playoff um, rounds. Uh, a lot of them are 22, 23, 24, right, um, with the rebuild. So all those players are growing up together. Um, and you could argue that they probably need a bit more growing up to do just on the ice in terms of their maturity. Um, the big theme here has been uh, in Ottawa trying to kind of be mature in the way they end games and, and mm-hmm. play against the best teams and not get frazzled. Um, and uh, they've been doing a bit better at that, but it's the, it's not this quantum leap since Maltain's taken over and the new coach bump that hasn't come to Ottawa, unfortunately. Well, it sounds like a problem the Jets have had in past years where they would have like a really young forward core, but an established defensive core and now or reverse. And so, it's, I mean, again, it's not a great problem to have right now, but maybe in a few years in Ottawa, 
uh, you know, it'll all turn around because like you said, those players will mature. You make a few additions, you get some goaltending and suddenly things change. So Alex, on that notion, that idea of, of the fans and what the fan base is like, again, the fan base has been subjected to a lot in, in Ottawa with the ownership uh, transition and, you know, the arena talk and the moving the arena and, and what is the temperature of the fan base right now? We know Canadian markets are always have a, they always go run hot. Yeah. But what is it like right now with, you know, like we know, look, look you, you missed the playoffs seven straight. See, I couldn't imagine to be honest with you, what Winnipeg fan base would be like if they had missed the playoffs seven straight years, they, they go nuts. They miss, you know, one year, let alone seven and, and then lose in the first round last year. Yeah. So, What's it like in Ottawa where, you know, you're not quite at Buffalo's, what is it, 13 or 14 years in a row, but, you know, seven years is a significant number for a Canadian fan base to not uh, be in the playoffs. How are the fans handling that? I'd say the one word that you hear with Sens fans is apathy. That's the theme is, is especially this season, um, talking amongst fans, media, it's almost the worst one out of the seven in a way because it finally felt you have a new owner, they're spending money, they have a young core. They took a bit of a step last year. They're on the right way. Even if they, let's say they missed the playoffs by two points or something, mm-hmm. it, it felt as though they're going in the right direction. And it's just been this giant step back. And there's nothing really to be excited about because it every year has been at the end of the season. Next year's will be the year, right? It's like that Boston Red Sox adage <laughs> trying to win the World <laughs> Series before 2004, right? is next year will be the year and it it hasn't Mm. been right and they've taken they haven't just been the same team or relatively the same they've taken a giant step back um i do think that they needed a new coach for a long time um but if you talk about the temperature in the room i think with the new ownership uh it 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 just levies down a little bit of the the fire maybe between fans because i think people genuinely trust Michael Anlauer, he's invested a lot in the in the team, not just mm-hmm. um, on the ice, but behind the scenes, um, getting analytics departments, getting other like adding to the coaching staff. Um, so he's done a lot of good things, um, uh, and he's definitely investing in the community. So I think people are very happy with ownership. It will be very interesting because this will be Steve Steos' first off season. Uh, he was Michael Anlauer's guy. There's some rumors that he might bring in Jonathan Gruden, who is the 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 coach in Hamilton with Michael Anlauer. So mm. let's see what owner what people think about ownership in maybe next season. Um, <laughs> but I, I'd say for the most part, it's apathy and just discontent. And I don't blame any of the fans for it because you can only sell hope so long. Yeah. Um, and after seven years, uh, you know, it, it just you're what I think they're seventh in the. The odds for the number one pick uh i yeah. think they deserve the number one pick after all the <laughs> years of turmoil and turbulence so but that's i'd say pretty apathetic the the overall fan base and you, you touched on the off season there and kind of where they go from here i want to ask about that like the goaltending has let them down so much this year you have this young core how long are you going to wait for them to mature like you said um where do you think they go in the off season Obviously, getting the number one pick and getting Macklin Celebrini would be ideal. Um, but in terms of maybe finding a goaltender, any pending UFAs, RFAs, where do the Sens go uh, over the next couple months? It's going to be really fascinating because, one, the goaltending situation has to be addressed in some case. Uh, yep. If you look at Jonas Corpusello, his buyout isn't very onerous. That would be crazy to buy out a guy in the first year of, after the first year of his five-year contract, but it actually wouldn't be too bad because uh, his cap hit isn't very high. Um, mm-hmm. or do you, so I think the first one is goaltending. I think that Jacob Chikrin, uh, he has one year left on his deal. That's going to be fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know where they go with that, but I wouldn't be surprised if he, he's he gone in the offseason. I, I think that's going to be very much a big decision. I don't know if you can pay three left-handed shot defensemen uh, over – six to eight million dollars I, I just don't know how you can win that way and neither of them are really suited to playing on their offside so mm-hmm. that's another one the coach might be in a sense the most important thing because uh this coach this team has felt as though they needed a lot of structure in their game and maltain has brought that but they I, I, I truly believe they need a pretty hard-nosed coach to, to bring in some defensive structure that might sound a little bit like Rick Bonus coming to, to Winnipeg two years ago. And I, I would say 
that's sure. kind of the apples to apples to me is they need a guy that comes in with that structure because they have they have the skill i think they, they're 14th in goals this year um per game so it's not they, they can't score it's just they can't defend um so it's going to be very fascinating um pinto has is an rfa obviously the the betting um suspension we'll see what leverage he has but he's been really really good since uh, he's come mm -hmm. back he has like 20 points in 26 games after missing a training camp so he's a really good player still only 23 i believe um so those are really the the off-season decisions and then even Claude Giroux um I'd imagine he stays but if the Sens are not a good team uh at the deadline next year uh, that's going to be another decision because he has one year left on his contract mm -hmm. well then Alex I want to ask you about the captain how's he handling it we know something about Kachuk's in this city so of course because his father played for the Winnipeg Jets 1.0 so how is Brady Kachuk? We know how competitive he is. We know how much he desires to win. You know, they always see the, him and his brother, Matthew, in the spotlight. Brother getting to the Stanley Cup Finals last year. He was cheering him on, which is what you do, support family. But from, from your perspective, as the captain, and it's not an easy role in a Canadian market, and it takes some time, and there's different uh, uh, personalities. You know, Adam Lowry has been a fantastic uh, selection for the Winnipeg Jets uh, with the way he speaks, the way he talks, the way he interacts. How have you seen Brady Kachuk grow in that role as captain? Uh, I feel, if I'm being completely honest, I feel like he hasn't really taken the step on the ice that you'd like to see. Um, I think, again, when you talk about maturity, that might start with him. Early on in the season, they were losing games, and he'd just start fighting people. Uh, he went at uh, what's Kachekov once. He got poke checked on yeah, a yeah. on a, a <clears throat> break, or not a breakaway on a penalty shot. But he's kind of lost his cool and tried to fight guys. And I'm not against fighting or anything like that. But the team's down, and he, you're taking one of your best players, and he's just getting upset. And it, that almost felt like he embodied the team, where when things are going great, flying high. But when things go are going bad, we kind of they they they've somewhat lost their cool. And um, so I think if you talk about the bigger picture in the community, he's doing stuff with um, him and his wife and they're expecting a newborn baby as well, or, um, you know, kind of talk about calling Ottawa home and they've done a lot of things in the commu community. So I think his off ice impact has been awesome. Uh, I'd say maybe in the leading on the ice, uh, maybe not the best, but I, I, I wouldn't say he's a bad teammate or anything like that. Just more maybe needs to be a bit more mature like the rest of his team. And I alluded to it earlier with Jacob Chikrin talking about the leaders stepping up. He, he didn't mention Kachuk. He mentioned uh, Claude Giroux, right? And I think in a sense, he's the real captain of this team um, and the, the true leader. And, uh, you know, Brady Kachuk's only, I think, 24. So he's still a really young guy in this league, even mm -hmm. though he's the league for six years and it feels as though he's 28 um, <laughs> so uh i i think that's an area where i'd like him and tim to really improve in terms of their their maturity on the ice and they get very frustrated frustrated very easily and just maybe mm -hmm. being a bit more not riding the highs and lows and just being a bit more calm and cool and collected well last one for you here alex and we appreciate you joining us on the show but you know, we've been talking about a lot of young players that are on the team. What is the the prospect pool look like for Ottawa? Is it is it is it still promising, or or is it basically everybody is in the organization that's that you're looking at, and that's kind of it? You answer my you answered the question. Yeah, uh, they they don't they don't have much there. Uh, Tyler Clevin, you'll see him tonight. He's a really good skater. Played pretty well in Belleville. Pierre Dorian said that if I could have a child, he'd be my other son. Um, so that was a great quote. Uh, but he's a huge guy, big body, but I, I don't see him higher than maybe a four or five defenseman in this league. Um, they have Zach Ostapchuk, but they don't really have a lot of uh, prospects because they traded two first-round picks for um, Alex Dabrinkit and then for Jacob Chikrin, some right. second-round picks in there as well. Uh, Tyler Boucher hasn't panned out. He has another shoulder surgery out again for the season. So I don't know. I think he's a bit apt to Chaz Luchis for the Jets where he just keeps getting injured. Although I think Luchis has played much better when he has played than Tyler Boucher. But um, they don't really have a lot of prospects. And that's mm -hmm. the issue. Although this this draft, they'll have two first round picks, a second round pick. They'll, they'll recoup some of their prospects, but they do have a lot of young players. Ridley Gregg's played really well 
was amazing to start the season, got a high ankle sprain, hasn't been the same, but still a really young, promising player, Shane Pinto. But as you said, almost all their players have, have graduated to the NHL, and that's probably a part of the lack of maturity is just they're such a young group. Well, we appreciate the insight into the Ottawa Senators, the Jets' opponent that they'll be taking on around 6 o'clock here in Winnipeg, probably a little later because I believe it's a sports net game, so it'll probably start around 6.15, 6.20. But the puck drop supposedly is six o'clock. We'll be getting started with the illegal curve post game show probably around eight forty or nine o'clock. Anyways, Alex, thanks very much for joining us for making your debut appearance here on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Thanks so much for having me, and I hope the Jets go uh, deep in the playoffs and maybe get a little Stanley Cup and uh, back to Manitoba. So that'd be pretty cool. We appreciate it. Thanks, Alex. Thanks a lot. Have a great rest of your day. We'll talk to you soon. There he goes. That's Alex Adams, the hockey news. He uh, he's he's. Uh, Fresh young voice. We're we're documenting mm-hmm. the fresh young voices here on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show today. Connor is, of course, probably the freshest and the youngest in the community, but uh, I I think I'm quite uh, uh, okay to say that he has done an excellent job here on this show and in our market. So uh, I'm I would say I'm probably a pretty hard judge, mm-hmm. and I can be a little bit uh, difficult. <laughs> but if I like you, then I really like you, and I really like Connor. He's a good dude. So well. Thank you very much, Dave. I'll, I'll just stop you there. I mean, we, we spent the whole year with the Moose together last year. That was so much fun. And I'm having a blast this year as well. We're sitting next together in the press box. So that's true. Yeah. Great. You, you get to steal cookies for me and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, the, exactly. The, I, the beauty of the hierarchy. I'm not that much higher than everybody else, but you know, Connor, <laughs> Connor he, he offers to do things. It's like, oh, thanks, Connor. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I don't know where two hours has gone. It seems like it's yeah, just wow. flown, like flown by, but of course, we can't allow. A show without Drew and Ezzy, although Ezzy would be fine, but we can't allow, allow a show without Drew Connor to go without one of these. Put on your antlers, it's time for the Manuk Moose Minute on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. The Manitoba Moose were in action, a little uh, uh, Good Friday action, two o'clock yesterday afternoon at Canada Life. Uh, really good crowd. I don't know, I don't know what it ended up being. It felt like it was at least five or six thousand. Mm-hmm. But uh the only change for the for the moose who were closing out a six game homestand, they played a really good game on uh Wednesday night against the Marlies. Played an excellent 60 minutes. Jay Miller wants me to show the Bauer fight. Uh you can just go to our nice. Instagram or my Twitter I see Dave. I've got it of Oof. course highlighted uh in any all anything it's do- need documenting. And, you know, Tico and Apolli wouldn't forgive me if I didn't have that Tyrell Bauer tilt um, with wow. Tate Singleton, who was just playing in his fifth AHL game on uh, Wednesday. He scored a goal, so that was pretty significant. But then he got absolutely, I believe the word was obliterated by some folks, uh, with ty- some some folks counting that Tyrell Bauer dropped about 19 shots in that fight with while Singleton didn't get one. I would so, avoid that guy. I, not yeah. to not to say like if I was a hockey player, but if I had to fight anyone, I think I'd avoid number two for the Manitoba moves. I, yes. I don't know. I just no, that's, get that fight would be, with that guy. <laughs> he's the nicest guy off the ice, but he is not a guy you want to get on the bad side on the ice. No. He defends his teammates. He looks after the the guys. He protects Thomas Millich, who seems to be getting the run of starts the 2023 fifth rounder for the Winnipeg Jets. He has been the guy they've gone to. 90% of starts down this stretch that they, again, we mm-hmm. talked about it and I've, I've gone over it significantly, but during that uh, road trip out against divisional opponents, uh, he, Milich was the man playing five of the six and getting five of the wins. And he continued to do that on this homestand. I believe he played five of six on the homestand. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he started five mm-hmm. of the six. So, I mean, Thomas Milich has been a key driver for this. Maybe not five. Uh, I think so. Maybe it's either five or six or four of six, but he got, pulled into one of the games when Colin Delia got pulled. Mm. So I know he played at least in five of the six, but the fact is that uh, Milich has become, you know, a staple and he's a battler. And I know that folks are, are excited about what he's going to do. I don't think he's ready for the backup role with Connor Hellebuck next year when inevitably Laurent Brassois will probably sign somewhere else. I mean, realistically to be a starter, but anyways, the Moose uh, coming into action, closing things out, wanting to have a good uh, effort. The only player not available for the Moose was Brad Lambert. Now, I don't know why, because again, I had to leave. And I believe after the game, Nolan Baumgartner, assistant coach, just didn't really, just said he was unavailable. So the Moose were a bit vague. Uh, there's a practice tomorrow. I'll try and get a little more insight as to the status of the 2022 first rounder, who's having a phenomenal season. But without mm-hmm. him, Henry Nikkinen, the 2019 fourth rounder, 
who, again, folks, if you don't want to believe me, the illegal curve bump is a real thing. Henry Nickinen had zero points in his first 35 games. Talks to the illegal curve, and he reels off nine and seven, and now he had a spectacular goal. If you didn't see it, make sure you check out, like I said, our Instagram or my personal page. But anyways, Moose got up to a good start. Five nothing shot edge, but it was the Marlies on a power play just with, I think, one second to go. Uh, they took the lead, one nothing. And then that Parker Ford character that I mentioned earlier, Connor, he gets his 15th of the season. Nice little redirection from uh, Fox Warren, Manitoba's Dawson Bartow, who's really become quite a, a solid player for the Moose. I wasn't sure what to expect, but he's become a, a pretty big staple of that defense group. So it was one all. And then Logan Shaw, former member of the Manitoba Moose, he gave the Marlies a 2-1 lead and uh, found some soft ice. So you're like, okay, well, you know, it was a, it was a good period. The Moose really kind of had, a, I thought, the majority of the play in that first. And so you thought, okay, well, they'll come out and they'll start the second real well. I don't even think I was sitting down in my seat before there was a chance and uh, Nikita Chibrikov slides into um, Thomas Millich, oh, yeah. knocks him a, a skew, and then they get a Ugh. goal. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Like I, like, I can understand it because even though the Marlies player went into Millich, he's knocked in by the Moose. So, But then the Nets off the moorings, they called it a good goal. So that could have been fra- r- rather deflating for the Moose. You know, and, and again, you know, while they do have a good spot where they are in the fifth and final playoff spot in the central, you, you can't afford to take any games off. So it's three, one mm-hmm. for the Marlies. But then, as I said, big response, Henry Nickinen just makes a real nice play, chips the puck up and over the defender and then put goes roof to make it a three, two game. That's his sixth goal of the season, which is a career high. Yeah. And then, you know, you talk about hockey being a funny game and how bizarre hockey can be. Sometimes it's three, two, the Marlies play. And I don't remember the Marlies player who drops it. Alex Steves has a wide open net. And if I say wide open, I'm like, I'm not joking. The net is wide open and he rings it off the post. And I thought, wow, what a, what a turn of events. Like it was, it was three, two for the Marlies. They score. I'm not saying that the Moose couldn't come back, but it's, it's, it's deflating. And all of a sudden they don't score. Moose take the puck. They go the other way. They don't score, but they get a power play. And then on the power play, Kyle Capobianco. He scores his 10th goal of the season, his 40, I think it's, well, I think it's his 48th point to 46th point. I'm not sure. 46 mm-hmm. point, 10 goals, 36 assists in 61 games. That's his, uh, to make it three all, he's now the leading scorer amongst defensemen in the AHL. So Kyle Capobianco wow. is uh, an effective player at the NHL level. He's not, I don't think he's ever had this level of success. So he ties the game. So you're like, okay, well, that's, that's big. How are things going to go in the third period? Well, Carson Golder. Gets his first AHL goal. Really nice move. Right. Has some strength along the wall. Gets free. Uh, scores to make it 4-3. And uh, both teams had chances, but the Moose close it out. And they end up winning, which is significant because, remember, we're, we're keeping we're talking about keeping distance between the fourth the, the teams that are in 6th and 7th, Iowa and Chicago, but also trying to gain on Texas. Because the Texas Stars, the farm team of Dallas, have not been playing particularly well. And mm-hmm. uh, they've slid. And so as a result of their slide, they ended up playing and losing to Iowa last night. So the Moose now are three points back of fourth place. Coincidentally, Connor, I know you're curious about this. The Moose end the regular season in Texas with two games against the Stars. So it's setting itself up to be a heck of a fun uh, end of the regular season. And like I said, oh, go ahead, jump in. I do, I do want to ask, is that because they've played each other like a million times, it feels like over the last however many years. Is there any chance that the Moose and Admirals meet in the first round? Thank you for asking. That is a good question by you. Just by the way, take fruits. We want pancakes. The, the Moose did get pancakes. The Moose won, I should say, everybody pancakes because Andrew Haleko saying we got pancakes. It is true, courtesy of that goal by Carson Golder. So that is everybody in the building. They needed only one goal to win pancakes. They got the one goal. So everybody got free pancakes. Anyways, what I was going to say to answer your question there is a good chance. So if everything plays oh, out boy. And right now, <laughs> things are looking like they could play out this way. Grand Rapids would play. Um, Grand Rapids would play um, Rockford. That's okay. two versus three. And now right now, if the Moose can catch Texas, which would be big, they'll have home ice for their best of three. To It's called a play in. So if they can mm-hmm. win that. And I, of all the teams in the central, I think they match up well against Texas and Texas isn't going to get Logan Stankoven back. Isn't going to get, you know, right now the stars have a lot of their guys. 
Mm-hmm. So I think that matchup works well. In addition to when those guys are healthy, I think that they match up well against Texas. But if they can get past Texas, then they'll most likely, I haven't checked to see if Grand Rapids can catch Milwaukee, but I don't think they can. Because Milwaukee, the Nashville Farm uh, team, won 19 straight games from January till February, but have hit a complete slide. So if ever there's a year, and Nashville, we know, is going to be a playoff team, most likely, so they're not going to be sending guys down to the farm club. If ever there was a year that the Moose have some sort of advantages going into the playoffs, I think it's this year. They've got goaltending. The defense has played better. Their forwards have come together. So of all the years to be paying attention with all these Jets prospects, with Nikita Chibrikov, Brad Lambert, even guys like Daniel Torgerson, Henry Nikkinen, Billy Hainola, Tyrell Bauer, I'm probably, well, Danny Nijilkin and Chaz Lucius, who are both done for the season with injuries, but there's lots of excitement. In, and as I said, folks, guys, they signed out of college, a guy like Parker Ford or guys like um, potentially Rucker McGordy, Elias Salamonson, Connor, once his season's done right. in, in with Schlefka. So there's possibilities that you might see some of these other prospects. Connor Levis, who's having a great season, right? And then um, who's, who, uh, who's playing for the London Knights that I'm forgetting? Um, Jacob Julian. Jacob Julian, who's playing and having, I think he's having, he's having a great. monster. Sex. He had like yeah. 16 points last year and he's got like 78 this year for, for London. So if his season ends, he's going to come to the Moose and, and make some, uh, potentially get a, some opportunities. We'll see. It's mm-hmm. all very exciting. It's going to be a fun final nine games for the Moose. Final nine games for the Jets goes tonight. We're already into overtime, so we're going to end the show here. But we want to say thank you to everyone who has joined us, including Connor. Connor, do you have any final parting words for the chat? Now that you're, uh, you know, like I said, made your inaugural debut here on the Illegal Curve uh, Saturday morning show. Yeah, this is a ton of fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you to everyone who joined us in chat. Um, and yeah, I'll see you, see you in a few hours, Dave. Um, yeah. Up in the press box. Uh, yeah, I see, I see a lot of people as well, like just roaming the concourse. I like to do that before the games. I like to go say hi to the people that, um, like some of my family members have season tickets. I go say hi, see a lot of people. So if you see me, say hi. And uh, yeah, should be a great game tonight. Hopefully the Jets can end their slide because I- I'm watching for the power play, to be honest. If they can end their power play slide, I think that's a win. But they- they've got a win against Ottawa. This is a it's not wow. a must win, but it's 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 there. It's no, it's but there. I mean you wanna you wanna have a good showing. So like just like Connor had a good showing, the Jets fans and the Jets team are gonna be hoping to see a long showing from the Winnipeg or from a good showing, I should say, from the Winnipeg Jets. Well, where's uh where's our boy Frosty with the with the with the um uh, sponsors if he's not gonna get it up there? I will say this has been a, a lot of fun, and I want to thank Connor for joining us. I want to thank all of you for spending your Saturday morning here on the illegal curve hockey show we've had a ton of fun we've had a ton of you make sure you smash that like button make sure you're subscribing make sure you leave comments and make sure you share our social media stuff if you're on facebook you see a post of mine maybe with a comment from connor connor probably not but if there is you never know <laughs> then then but there'll now be an I article will. from now connor there'll be an article from connor so if you yeah. can share it that's how you spread the word about illegal curve and that's what we appreciate what you do and that's how it makes this an even better channel each and every time we go live on here on our YouTube channel. Frosty's not doing it, so I'm just going to go without him, Connor. I know it anyways. Big thank wow. you to all of you, the sponsors of Illegal Curve who make the post-game show, the Saturday show, and the website, IllegalCurve.com. A possibility they are in no particular order. Rumors Restaurant and Comedy Club. Grid Park. Use code Illegal Curve to park for free. Remember, if you want to park for free, I've got codes. You just have to send me an email. David IllegalCurve.com. If you want to go to the game tonight... Send me an email, David illegal curve.com. We can set, set, hook you up. Grid park has given us free parking for the remaining home game. So if you want to go, I see Dave, David illegal curve.com. Winnipeggers you get a love chance. free parking, man. Winnipeggers, Winnipeggers love free love, parking. Absolutely. Love free parking. <laughs> Linden <laughs> market <Marketing laughs> center, Zapia group realty, Betway, tough duck, Boston pizza, Seagram's Rollies transfer, farmery beer, support these fine businesses because of their continued support of illegal curve hockey. One final thing I'm going to mention, because today is the final day, Connor, the final day to order Illegal Curve merch. So if you want to get some Illegal Curve merch, if you want to look like, well, Connor's wearing WST merch, but if you want to look like me, hold on, me, Illegal Curve. Oh, there we go. Matt Hyman stepping up for Frosty. We appreciate that, Matt Hyman. That's very nice. But if you want to get Illegal Curve merch, I'm putting a link to it on the in the chat. And of course, it is on the website and just under the merch button. But today is the final day to get in your order. So make sure you get that order in today. 
And I'll remember, I'll remind everyone tonight when we have the illegal curve post game show. And on the topic of merch, uh, you brought up the Gary Lawless thing. We, we got to talk yes. about this. People, people should buy illegal curve merch to stick it to Gary Lawless. Um, who was ra rather not pleased that I had a WST hoodie and he had nothing. Um, I, I met him for the first time because I didn't meet him when Vegas was here earlier this year. Yeah. And, uh, I met him and he basically was like, how'd you get that hoodie? Like, I don't even have a hat. I don't have a mug, anything. And then he did the hit with uh, Huss live from the arena and uh, said the same thing kind of live and uh, <laughs> made fun of me for having, he said I was uh, fresh out of the womb with a WST hoodie on and he can't even get one. But yes, that, there's one reason to buy legal curve merch or well, WST merch um, to, to make fun of Gary Lawless, who doesn't have that. There you go, Connor. With a little shot across the bow to <laughs> yeah. Gary Lawless and Rob. Rob yeah, called me won, up. So. Rob. Well. Rob called me. Yeah, that's true. Rob called me out, and he's right. I didn't realize because I, of course, I tend to just think about game days, but there are actually thirty-one days in March. So tomorrow will be officially your mm -hmm. last day, not today. So you have today and tomorrow to get in your orders. Anyways, it's been enough of us. We got to get this podcast posted. Then Connor should get be able to get his day started, as should I. And then we will, uh, of course, be back here around 8.40, start, well, we we hope 8.40, but maybe closer to 9, given the, the late start time. Due to Sportsnet, thanks very much for joining us here on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. He's Connor Rapchek. I'm Dave Manuk. It's been a fun Saturday morning. We'll see you today, later today, on the Illegal Curve Postgame Show.